Hello and welcome back to the Raspberry Ape podcast. This is one of the most requested episodes. It is, of course, the return of Simon Hayes. If you haven't listened to the first episode over six years ago, back in episode three, then you must have been living under a rock because it is one of the absolutely most listened to, most popular episodes of this podcast. Um, I have wanted to have Simon back on for many, many years. He has a very busy schedule. I have a very busy schedule. We are finally able to make it happen, um, and it was a pleasure to chat to him as always. We spoke about a whole host of different things including you know weight training uh, diet uh, Simon got big into cycling over uh, COVID uh, and the lockdowns loads of things about jiu-jitsu the advancing of of, of the modern jiu-jitsu game everything that's happening in the sport celebrities training uh, jiu-jitsu and competing in jiu-jitsu and a lot more so really really enjoyed recording this and I hope you guys enjoy listening check it out Simon Hayes, welcome back to the Raspberry Podcast. Thank you, Dan. It's been a long time. It's been six years. You were episode three. I believe that this episode is going to be episode 97. Wow. So, uh, yeah. And I mean, it, it, it really is a, a massive pleasure to have you back because you, not only were you one of the earliest episodes and um, really, really the first person that I reached out to outside of my very immediate circle. Obviously, I already was very familiar. We knew each other very well. Um, but, you know, my, my first one was with a very close friend. Second was with one of my instructors. And then I reached out to you, you know, so well known in the community. And I actually really credit that episode and our discussion in a lot of the success of how the podcast has gone since then because it really was a massively popular episode and um i feel like yeah so i actually thank you for for for, for helping me really get the podcast out there well wow, high praise and and you know what congratulations daniel you you've really really smashed this podcast and i listen to it regularly all of your guests, I'm super excited. Listen, Stephen Campbell. Mm. I was listening to that in the car last week. I, I had, I couldn't believe I'd missed it. And what a, that was great. You know, yeah. it was really, really great. I want to talk about that later because his podcast was just amazing. And he's one of those dudes that I haven't really uh, got to know well enough. And at the end of the podcast, I felt like I'd been there with him in Brazil. It was just, it was fantastic. And, you know, that's how I feel about all of your podcasts. You know, it's, it's an honor coming back. One of the problems has been actually that we didn't know during that first podcast that it was going to be so well received. Yeah, and I've actually. Oh, been I, I feel like I knew a little bit. I did <laughs> during the podcast. I knew it was going to. It was. This was going very well. But you know what? Was, <laughs> what what's interesting was I now I had those competition nerves about coming back, thinking mm. how how am I going to put on a performance as uh, as well as the first one you know yeah. because we and and what was great about the first one was you just let me go you you know I just spoke and spoke and spoke and you know it was the whole origin story so so what I'd say anyone who's kind of tuning into this one if you haven't listened to number one turn this off put it on pause go back to number one and listen to the origin story yeah and and then and then come and and, and listen to this one because we've got a lot of catching up to do a lot's you happened it's only six years, Dan, but think about how much jiu-jitsu's changed in those six years. Think about what we've all been through with COVID and lockdown. And, you know, we're in a completely different place in, in the UK than we were six years ago yeah. in so many different ways. Um, and I think, you know, we, it's time. It's time to talk about what's changed. It's time to talk about the direction that jiu-jitsu is heading in. Mm. It's time to talk about whether we're in a good position or a bad position and whether we need to bridge or whether we need to replace guard. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, getting straight into it, talking about jiu-jitsu, and, and we are, what, two weeks off of, or less than two weeks off of ADCC. Did you watch it? Are you, I know that you're more of a gi guy, but obviously you kind of, you, you very much view grappling uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as the f kind of fully encompassing gi and no gi and with striking as well. So, uh, you know, did you have your eye on that ADCC? 100%. And, and here's the thing. I've got to correct you. When you say I'm more of a gi guy, that's really just based on the competitions that you saw me sure. do coming through. I mean, I was there when you competed in the 10K ground clash. So yeah. I know you can and, throw down no gi. And, and, and what I would say about this is as I got better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu... I started to love the gi more. Yeah. As a white belt and a blue belt, I love no gi. And I'll tell you why. Because I very much feel that 
the difference between grades in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the difference between a white and a blue and a blue and a purple and a purple and a brown become very, very blurred when you take the gi off. Mm. I don't, because the thing is, you're taking away... You're taking away a lot of techniques. You're taking away a lot of the ability to stall. Yeah. You're If someone's good with the gi, they can stifle the other fighter's athletic ability. You take the gi off and suddenly there's a lot more scrambles. Athletic ability can... And I'm not saying gi's... I'm not saying that no gi isn't technical. Mm. Let's not go down that road because that's absolutely wrong. No yeah. gi is super, super technical in a different way. But... I think that Nogi, certainly the difference between the belts uh, is certainly more blurred. I think that a white belt is more likely to be able to tap a blue. A blue is more likely to be able to tap a purple in Nogi. In Nogi. And that's something that I loved. When I started training, and you, you know from the origin story that I started training with, with Guy Ritchie, whenever we take the gear, you know, Guy could tap me like a drum when he was a blue belt and I was a white belt. When we take the gear off, I could last longer. Mm. And so I suddenly had this real uh, love of no gi because I was I was better at it. I felt what I felt like I could I could uh you know I could do better stuff. I could be more athletic. Uh, I could get into scrambles more. As I've got older, I started loving the gi for the for the for that same reason because I can get hold of the fabric and stop someone moving so fast. Mm. I can and I was thinking about this earlier actually and I was thinking about Gordon Ryan versus Galvao. And then I was thinking about Roger versus Bashesha. Mm. In a way, those two matches were very similar. It was the, un, the you know, the, the old the school versus old the up school and coming. versus up and coming. Or, or the now and, versus and the And it was then, whether yeah. there was going to be, you know, a change of people's perception about who was better. And I would have loved to have seen Roger and Bishesha Nogi. I'm, Listen, I will always bet on Roger. I'm yeah. never, ever going to not bet on Roger because, man. But it would have been a very different match. Because if you think about it, when Roger dealt severely with Bashesha, and he did deal severely with him, yeah. um, it was down to that sleeve grip. Do you mm. remember that sleeve grip that he got? That he just, that sleeve grip stopped Bashesha's explosivity. It stopped his ability to move fast. It basically shut down his jiu-jitsu mm. you take the gi off that sleeve grip isn't there and that's and, and and that's what's interesting i think that uh that certainly you can use the gi to stifle explosivity and speed and that's one of the reasons why as an old guy i love the gi but it's also one of the reasons why when i was starting out in jiu-jitsu and i had a whole load of athletic ability and explosivity but i didn't have too many techniques i loved nogi because i could hang with people that were better than me yeah so do you think that the the gi is more i mean people keep on saying to me they keep threatening me i don't train in the gi at all at the moment and i haven't really since i got my black belt to be honest with you and uh, a lot of people are saying oh just wait a few more years you'll start to get old you'll start to slow down and you'll be you'll be all over that gi soon enough do you think it is more of a you know it, it, it just complements the physical attributes or the loss of that explosivity obviously as you get older strength is sort of the last thing to go Ex you know, the speed goes uh, quickly and the strength especially the isometric strength goes much later and it kind of plays into that key game i think you're right um but then you know there is th there's no black and white in this discussion and there is no right and wrong because here's the thing as you get old, the gi starts to hurt your fingers more. Mm. There's no doubt. You look at, and, and look, I'm only right now, I'm only training two or three times a week because I'm 53 years old. And that's all I can, I can only train two or three times a week at 100% mm. um, and recover. Um, so I'm using other methods to stay fit because anything more than that, um, and, and gi jiu-jitsu is very, very hard on the body. It's hard on the small joints. Um and you look at any instructors that are full time. You look at and they're, and they're gi instructors. You look at their fingers. They're yeah. they're a mess. So one of the things that I love about no gi is I actually think in some ways it's healthier. Yeah, I agree. It's not as healthy for the knees. Okay, no. and we and, and again that's going to be part of the things that we talk about today. I, you know, I've got a lot. How, to, how to, so? How so? Do you think with the knees? I, I think I, I probably agree with you with the knees. I think that uh, 
well, look, you know, we've got a massive discussion to have about leg locks yeah. because if we, you know, if we don't discuss leg locks, we'd be doing the jiu-jitsu community a disservice because it's been such a huge part of this massive shift forward in what jiu-jitsu is, how people win competitions. Um, but what I would say... Oh, so, so the... the it's harsh when your knees because you're having to defend against a lot of different kinds, these twisting leg locks and heel Absol- hooks and stuff absolutely. like that. Absolutely. And, okay. and, pr- and the problem is until people get to high level purple, brown or black, they don't understand that they're not feeling pain. So why should they yeah. tap? And then pop, it goes. Yeah. And that's, and that was really, look, I, you know, I had different instructors as, uh, as a, a white belt and a blue belt and a purple belt, you know, one of my instructors, my main instructor still to this day is Wilson Jr. who came from a Luta Lever background. And so he was very, you know, he was very, very uh, pro leg locks. Mm. They were never, it was never frowned upon, which, you know, which is something I want to talk about today uh, be- because there's, you know, I'm s- reading a lot of stuff on the internet saying, oh, in jiu-jitsu, uh, leg locks were seen as, as something dirty. Not in our, not in my school, not in Carlson Gracie team. They never were. We were never ever told. Oh, this is this is a cheap sh- a cheap shot. I think is the way it's yeah. described a lot. What about wrist internet. locks? Are they wrist locks? Do you know what? No one was ever very good at them. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't particularly like wrist locks. Okay. I'll tell you why I don't like wrist locks, and it's purely about ego. Yeah. I'm never going to tap for a wrist so lock. So you're just going to end up mangling So I'm going to end up with hurt wrists. Okay? <laughs> I quite like them, you know. I quite Look, like they them. they work. They do they work. work. And, they, and they work to open other stuff up. They work to, to open other stuff up. That was just up. me like, uh, th- don't, don't let me distract you from the leg no, lock stuff. No, but it's interesting because... Cause, cause, but you're right, though. It was, uh, I think the saying's like, um, the choke is king... The, uh, the, the, the arm locks are queen and, you know, the leg locks are like a thief or a scoundrel. And then you go to further well, down there well, and we, wrist locks are like a full, full blown prison rules. Well, with regards to leg locks, we never had this stigma at Carlson Gracie team because, because Wilson mm. came from a Luta Lever background before he ever put on a gi. So leg locks were no big deal. And then if we go back even further and we talk about Chen Marais, who um, who again appeared in my Origins podcast, who was the, you know, with Maurizio was the first instructor yeah. in the UK. And there was all, and, and Chen was teaching, was teaching, uh, you know, figure four footlocks to white belts. That was, you know, that was part of who he was. So much so that at the time there was a bit of mystery around Chen and exactly what his background was in jiu-jitsu. And there were all sorts of rumors. And one of the rumors was, was that Chen wasn't really a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy. He must be a Luta Livre guy because mm. he taught so many, so many leg locks. And I actually bought into that rumor. It was only later on. Um, when I started doing more research, that I realised that 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 wasn't true. Chen was a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy. I I'm assuming because he taught so many leg locks in the year 2000 in London in his class, um, where he t- you know he he allowed all leg locks apart from heel hooks. We didn't get taught heel hooks, but knee bars and and figure fours were allowed at white belt. Mm. Um, and I think that he must have gone and trained Luta Livre. But I've seen pictures of him 12 years old wearing a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gi with a green belt on. Yeah. So, you know, I know that he comes from a jiu-jitsu background. That, that's clear to me now. But he, he obviously did some cross-training with the Luta Livre guys. But going back to my two different, my main instructors coming through was Wilson, who came from a Luta Livre background, and then Nelson, who came from a judo background. So Nelson's thing was, he didn't think that leg locks were a cheap shot. He just said, you need to pass the guard. Yeah. And his problem with leg locks was if you're always going to rely on leg locks, mm. you're potentially not going to learn to pass the guard. And so now in my classes, you know, it's 2022, we've got to take leg locks seriously. Yep. Anyone that isn't is being an absolute idiot. Um, but what I will say to, to white belts is look, if you start relying on leg locks in a white belt class and you're and, and you're 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 sitting back in someone's guard and you're putting on an Achilles lock, you've got to think to yourself, have you learned to pass the guard? Mm. Because the thing is, if you've got a great Achilles lock and you're tapping other white belts, you try that on a blue belt, they're gonna have the defense for it. And so suddenly you haven't got a guard pass and you haven't got an Achilles lock. Yeah. You've got nothing. Um, and so one of the things that I say to them is, look, if you want to practice your leg locks, great. Put a goal in your mind in sparring. Right, 
I'm going to pass my I'm going to pass this guy's guard once and potentially tap him. Mm. And then after I've done that, the next time we bump fists and we start again, that's when I'll go for my leg lock. So you almost give yourself this goal and this reward of, I'll go for the leg lock once I've proved I can pass his guard once. And that way you make sure that people aren't just sitting back when they can't pass the guard. Because I saw that happen to a lot of people yeah. um, coming through. There was one particular dude that trained at Carlson's. He's a really, really great fighter, but he never... What he did was he got hold of the Craig Kukuk and Henzo Gracie instructionals, which were old school. I think Henzo made those with Craig Kukuk, who was one of his first. Uh, mm. Sorry if I'm pronouncing his name wrong, Craig. If you're listening to this, I apologize. But it's, it's K-U-K-U-K. Kukuk. Um, and he was one of Henzo's first black belts. And he made a very early instructional with all sorts of leg locks. Mm. And so this dude at Carlson's went and watched these, these leg locks and that's all he ever did. Um, and he didn't learn to pass the guard and he had a really, really evil leg lock, but we all gradually learned to defend his leg locks and he was left with nothing. And he eventually mm. petered out at kind of purple belt and gave up jujitsu. And it was a shame. And that's what I would say people need to be careful of with leg locks that before you start concentrating on them and going for them all the time you make sure that you understand the rest of the system yeah but that said i'm a massive fan of what danaher has done he's revolutionized the game with his team you know and i think the difference is i think what dan has done which goes beyond what we did as brazilian jiu-jitsu athletes before this new revolution was that my concern always with leg locks was that if I went for a leg lock, I might get leg locked myself. Yep. And to be honest with you, no one ever taught me how to tuck my legs in, how to triangle my legs, how to make sure that I wasn't exposing my own ankles when I sat back. I was taught how to defend leg locks. You know, with the gi, grab the collar, sit up, mm. stand up, get your, you know, get your, get the sole of your foot on the floor. But what I wasn't taught was when I sit back and go for my own leg lock, how to hide my own legs. And I think that what Danaher's system has done is revolutionized the ability for athletes to hide their own feet so they can be confident mm. to go for leg locks without exposing their own ankles. To, whether it be heel hooks or straight or whatever, mm. or a steamer locks. Oh, steamer locks. Oh, nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. Nasty, nasty yeah. stuff. Um, so that's what I think about leg locks. I think it's it's great, but I think that people need to understand that you've also got to concentrate on passing the guard. And we had that drilled into us by Nelson Solari. Mm. You know, you pass the guard, pass the guard, pass the guard. You know, I can remember him shouting that continually. Um, yeah, I, I think you're spot on. And, and it is this kind of ongoing debate about how do you introduce leg locks into uh, a beginner's training? And, you know, when I was teaching, uh, when I was teaching full time at Mill Hill, I still had, I put limitations on, so I had a grading system. We're going to talk about Nogi grading system, but basically at the, the, at the very early stages, I actually allowed less than jujitsu would. So for most people back then, you know, five or six years ago before, uh, before this leg lock game became super popular like it is now, where now most people will be very comfortable in heel hooks, even as white or blue belts. But back then, the standard would be you start off, it's straight ankle locks only up until brown belt. Then it's uh, knee bars and twisting foot locks. And then maybe a black belt, if you're lucky, it's heel hooks. You know, um, the way what, what I did was I would make it less to begin with. So I wouldn't allow... Uh, and, and it would be based on who the, 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 the grade that you are and who you're going up against. So basically a white belt and a white belt, no leg locks. A white belt and a, a blue belt equivalent, well, then you can go for leg locks. Because I also, I saw a lot of people who would sit back on uh, ankle lock and just blow someone's knee out because they basically had no idea what they were doing. So I kind of wanted to take that away. So part of that thing is safety. But actually, I think a bigger thing is if you have someone who gets a Danaher instructional or a Craig Jones or a Lachlan Giles instructional and becomes proficient in one, you know, specializes in leg locks, then exactly like you said, they miss out on a lot of the other parts of the game because passing guard's really hard, mm. right? Especially yeah. these days, people's guard retention is so good. Passing guard is really, really difficult and sitting back for leg locks 
isn't. Mm. For a lot of people, it's a cheat code to not having to get past the guard. So I think you're right in saying that uh, it's putting a lot of it's putting a lot of uh, um, you're trusting individuals to stop themselves from doing that. If you just say, "Well, go for a." You know, go for go for a guard pass, and after you get a guard pass, then you can go for a leg lock. You kind of got to go, okay, guys, for this round, no leg locks. We're looking to pass the guard, or really working on specific sparring, constraint based training, where you're saying you have to pass the guard. You can't get away. Uh, you know, in this particular drill, you can't be sitting back for the leg lock and forcing them through the structure of the actual training and sparring to develop both sides of the game. A hundred percent. I agree with that. And uh, we did things slightly different at Carlson's. What we always did with Carlson's was um, we had a rule. It was an unwritten rule, but we had a rule for many years that if you were wearing a gi, white belts couldn't go for any leg locks, not even IBJJF legal. Uh, That's what I'm saying. Yeah, Achilles I do the locks. same. Yeah, uh, that 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 was the rule. Uh, we dismissed that rule recently, which I'll yeah. come to in a minute. Um, and then, But then what we would do, we'd do something slightly different to IBJJF rules. When you got your blue belt in the gi, you were allowed to do every single leg lock apart from a heel hook. Yeah. You could do figure fours. You could do a steamers. You could obviously do uh, a, a straight Achilles lock. Um, and you could do knee bars yeah. at Blue Belt. And it's the, very at, similar to and, what I and did. And the yeah. reason that Wilson gave us for that was to start preparing people for the rule change at Black, uh, Brown Belt. Mm. So that when they got to Brown Belt, they were ready. But then what we would do is for the white belt saying, but hang on a second, why aren't I allowed to, to, to use leg locks? We would allow them in the, in the no gi class. Mm. And the whole thing, you know, my instructors had a very old school attitude towards no gi. And the old school attitude, and, you know, to quote, to, to quote Nelson Solari was, when the belt, you know, when the belt comes off, there are no grades. Sure. You know. Um, the only thing that we weren't allowed to do was heel hooks. And, yeah. and, and Nelson's attitude towards heel, heel hooks back in the day was that's something you do when you're fighting for money. Mm. You know, you, you want to break my knee, then I need to be paid. Yeah. You know, and that's a very old school kind of Brazilian attitude, and which, which again, we have modernized now at Carlson's. We've, we've, we've changed completely. So where we are right now at Carlson Gracie team is we are allowing white belts to do IBJJF footlocks because, of course, the competition scene has changed. Yeah. And if we weren't allowing people to do that for us... It, it's the, a disadvantage. We, yeah. we, exactly. We'd be holding people back and they would be going potentially to the Europeans or wherever and just getting ankle locked because mm. they hadn't been exposed to them enough. We still have the rule that at Blue Belt you can do every single footlock apart from a heel hook. And now what we do with the heel hooks, you know, the, our attitude to heel hooks changed around about the time that Freddie came to train with us mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Yeah. You know, um, we needed to modernize what we were doing. Freddie arrived around about the same time as heel hooks started becoming very, very uh, popular and revolutionized the no gi game. We knew that we needed to allow Freddie to develop himself. So we can't be saying to someone who specializes in leg locks, no Not heel hooks. Lockdown, yeah. And we also knew that actually it was time to move on. And Dickie and me had some very, very, you know, some, we, we, we really talked it out. And we were like, look, look, what are the pros and cons of this? And now our rules are with leg locks at Carlson's in the no gi classes, you agree with someone beforehand. You, okay, as you're bumping so fists, simple. You, 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 you say, yeah. You all right with leg locks? And and one of the things that we always say to the students is, if you're not all right with leg locks because you want to go to work tomorrow and you don't want to break your it's knee. It's totally cool. It's totally cool. Please do Spot not on. feel yeah. pressure about this. Yeah. But if two fighters agree at the beginning of the round, then leg locks are fine. And we also, and look, listen, I don't run the no click gi class right now, but I do, when I'm teaching the Saturday competition class, we do a big percentage of it without the gear on we, yeah. with the gear on gear off gear on gear off and one of the things i'll say is is we, we we operate catch and release if you catch someone in a heel hook and they're not tapping you release it okay and you basically start start again okay and you say to them you know you should have tapped dude um, what you don't do is you don't wait for the tap you don't crank it on and that's the problem with heel hooks it, it, you know a lot of people don't have any nerve endings in their knees and they will only feel it when it's gone. Mm. And because we've all got huge egos, you know, as I said before to you, Dan, all of this stuff about leave the ego at the door, no one ever does. 
right? Yeah. It's very rare. It's a you principle. Know? It's it, not uh, exactly. It's easier said than done. It's for really sure. easier said than done. And the problem is, is that when you're not feeling pain with an ankle, with, with, with an elbow lock, you feel pain before the damage occurs. You get mm. that early warning sis- sign. The same with a choke. You start to see the little light at the end of the tunnel, mm. and it's getting smaller mm. and smaller. You know you're going to go to sleep. With the w- with the heel hook. You know, as a black belt, I know if someone catches me and I haven't got the escape, my knee is going to explode if I don't tap. But do white belts, blue belts and and purple belts? No, they think that they're invincible, especially if they're 22 years old and they're squatting and deadlifting three times a week. You know, they don't they don't realize that their knee is going to go. And of course, when it does go, that's can be a career ender for for a jujitsu fighter. Yeah. You know, so I think. I think heel, heel hooks are a really good thing, but I do think that they need to be explained to students and the conversation needs to be had. And I try and have the conversation. I, I'm, I mean, you're spot on. We really do agree on a lot of this stuff. Um, I mean, exactly the same sort of idea. It takes five seconds at the beginning of a roll to just go. And I, I used to, I would do it every single roll I would do. You'd sit down, you slap hands, you go... What do you want to play? Do you want to play? And this would be with people that I'm used to, you know, used to training with. And you go, you know, at, firstly, any injuries? Yeah. Literally, it's a 10 second conversation. Any injuries? No, I'm all good. Or my shoulder's bad. Oh, is it right shoulder? Okay, I'm not going to come your right shoulder. Simple as that. Yeah. Or um, what do you want to play? And they go, I'm competing on the weekend uh, in grapple industries, all, all, everything legal. Or they go, I'm competing on the weekend in uh, IBJJF. So, uh, you know, just knee bars and twisting foot looks sound slap yeah. hands go and, and and it's something that it just it makes sure that everyone's on the same page you understand what just don't assume that your training partner knows what you're thinking especially if you're going to a different gym or if you're at an open mat but even in your own academy just it's it's a tend i think it's just courteous to to, to make sure that, that that everyone knows what's up before you slap hands mm. and go but i do think that the advent of leg locks becoming so popular has really moved jiu-jitsu forward. And not just because people are leg locking each other. Mm. What it's done is whenever there's, whenever something changes in a game, there's a knock on effect to the whole game. And what's interesting now is if we look at the way that Gordon Ryan's playing jiu-jitsu, okay, he's getting opportunities on the upper body Mm. that maybe are becoming available to him because people are so shit scared of him getting hold of their legs. And it's the same as anything, you know, if you're good at judo, right? People are going to sit down to uh, and play guard. So yeah. it's almost like whatever, when people know that you've got a strength, they're going to hide from that strength. And it means that you can actually start to attack something else. And, and I, you know, when I watched uh, Gordon versus Galvao, I felt that Galvao was so intent on not giving up his legs that actually it enabled Gordon to do what Gordon's game plan was, yeah. which was to take the upper body and get to the back and choke him. And that's the great thing about anything, leg locks included. You st- people get better at them. It actually opens up other areas of jiu-jitsu. Mm. It's one big puzzle, right? And the whole thing feeds off each other. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I always, when I teach, that's kind of what, for me, that is the whole essence of jujitsu is options, right? Yeah. And, and as long as you have options, you're in control. It's when you run out of options that everything, you know, either you have to completely abandon the path that you're on and try and switch to something else, or if someone's attacking you, mm. you have options to a maneuver or escape or counter. And if you run out of options, you get left with only one and that's the tap out. So you, you, all techniques should be done with that in mind where it's not just a means to an end but if that end isn't viable then keeping yourself able to chain it to many other things be that submissions be that be that positions be that transitions whatever yeah yeah Mm. you know did you listen to gordon talking to joe rogan recently i didn't know it's well worth listening to i mean i've got to say that i kind of fell into the the whole you know looking at his social media uh his, the, the way that he conducts himself on social media and I, I and you know and he plays the villain and he's done very well at it and he's certainly monetized jiu-jitsu through that persona yeah but what i realized having never met him and spoken to him but listening to him recently with rogan dude he's clever yeah he's really really smart 
Um, and what I would, and also, what I loved about him was someone said, uh, Joe said to him, "How long are you going to? How long are you going to? Could you see yourself competing for?" And he said, "Well, at least till I'm forty, which I loved." Then he said, and, "Unless John stops teaching, and then I just stop." And that's when I realised that they have this this bond, this yeah. relationship, and you know, and that kind of you know, I'm the king, I can do that, you know, is not. Th- you know, he still has a huge, huge respect for yes. his teacher, yeah. which I love. I love that. I've got to say, I became a, I became an overnight fan. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm there, but, uh, you know, the, his skills are undeniable. And I think you're right. I don't think there are many other people in, in, in the entire sport that sort of have that sensei, student, you know, the master and student uh, dynamic I'd probably compare it to a Sith Lord and his apprentice, actually, now I think about them. Uh, um, but yeah, you, you know, he's certainly... J- John Danaher is certainly something special, what he's been able to do with not just Gordon, but all of his students. Um, there's something special going on there. And yeah, you're right, Gordon gives all the credit where it's due to John. And it's interesting that John's now started talking about, you know, he's done with his leg locks. Everyone, you know, first of all, he's caught up with it. Yeah. Everyone's caught up with it now. And now he's talking about takedowns and yeah. he's saying, look, you know, the next big hole in Brazilian jiu-jitsu is we are as a sport terrible at takedowns. Mm. You know, we're not as good at wrestling as wrestlers. We're not as good at, uh, judo as judokas and we should be and we should be training it. it, it is it possible for in the same way that sort of a decathlete is not going to be as good in their individual sport as someone who is specializing in that individual sport should should jiu-jitsu people even be it, it's so it, it's like mma right like there's no there's very few people in mma who are going to be good as a, you know at boxing as the top boxer or good at jiu jitsu as the top jiu jitsu guy uh should that even be a goal for 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 grapplers to try and achieve to have the same you know to have world class wrestling or judo outside of grappling well it's interesting daniel because this is a it's a very very big subject this yeah because let's look at khabib for a second all right now khabib isn't world class wrestling but you put strikes in there and he is world-class wrestling mm. because wrestling changes completely when you've got to think about strikes as well. Yeah, yeah. And what I would say about that question that you just asked me is, is that you don't need to be world-class at wrestling if you are also world-class at jiu-jitsu because wrestling changes under jiu-jitsu rules mm. because there are other threats like someone pulling straight to to deep half and suddenly ending up on top uh, uh, that you're not allowed to do in wrestling. Mm. And so actually the whole game changes. So should jiu-jitsu players be trying to get world-class at freestyle wrestling rules? No, of course not. But should they be good enough at wrestling that they can be a legitimate threat against other Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys that are good at sure. wrestling? Then yes, but because... The wrestling dynamic changes the moment you're allowed to do an Imanari Im- roll mm. and grab the leg. It, it it changes what works and what doesn't. And, and that's what's beautiful about grappling. And what I would say about Dana her talking about takedowns is he's right. The next person that is going to absolutely smash the ADCC apart is someone that people are completely scared to stand with because they can dominate the standing portion. And by the way, we've got a really, really good example of that coming straight out of the UK. You know, with, with Owen, yeah, not just Owen. Uh, go on, Fion. Oh, of course, yeah, right. But I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true, true. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So, but that, Fion but, doesn't always use her judo. Yeah, you kind of forget but, that Fion's got a base her of judo opponents, sometimes. Yeah, her opponents are shit scared of her her, yeah. her judo. She doesn't even use it half mm. the time but it's always there in her back pocket. And what that does is it dictates where the fight's going to go. Yeah. And allows her, it's like, you know, if you can dictate whether the fight's, where, how the fight is going to hit the ground. And basically, you know, a lot of the time, Fionn knows that people aren't going to stand with her. Yeah. They're going to pull guard. So she gets really, really good at passing guard. And- right. And, and, and by the way, if she ever thinks to herself, this time I'd like to pull guard, she can grip and pull guard. Mm. But what I'm saying is, is that she dictates 
where the fight happens yeah. because she's got Judah in her back pocket. And I think that that's a great example of exactly what Dana has saying. Yeah. Right. But, but it's, it's a very ADCC thing, isn't it? And that's kind of the question, which is, you know, ADCC is by far the biggest uh, tournament in the sport of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Gi or No Gi. Obviously it is No Gi. Um, but, but is it the purest representation of grappling? Because it does favor the wrestler because you have penalizations for putting guard in the, you know, after the second half and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, would, would it be the same? Is, is John saying that the next evolution of the sport is in wrestling because that is actually what the sport needs as a whole? Or is it because that is what ADCC would favor and ADCC sort of acts as the metric to which we measure grappling? It's a difficult question, but what mm. I would say is this. Nogi is much, much better as a spectator sport. Of course. Well, we know that, yeah. Right. It's a better spectator sport. So when we talk about the evolution of grappling, well, how is grappling going to evolve? More spectators means more money. Yeah. More money means more athletes. More, ath more people will be able to make a living. And that's the big problem that we've got right now. Mm. There aren't enough athletes making a living out of jiu-jitsu. They're legitimately training full-time and they're not being paid enough money. Yeah. Um, and so I think that the platform of the ADCC is the evolution of grappling because it's the, it's the platform that is going to be watched by the most amount of people that don't understand grappling because it's more exciting. No one wants to watch a gi match. You know, unless you're into jiu-jitsu. Unless it's Tommy Lanaka or one of the other... Oh, uh, Tommy Lanaka's great. One of the other Scandinavian countries because yeah. for some reason they just have the most exciting... You know, we, we I saw Espin, uh, Espin on uh, Matisse on the weekend mm. again. Just super exciting gi grapplers. But yeah, for the most part, the, 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 the best gi matches are... 100% up there with the best nogi matches uh, but they're, they're, they're a lot more few and far between yeah. in general yeah because it's just it's easier to stall in the gi isn't yeah. it and, and and there's a lot of very small intricacies that um, one they slow the game down and it takes a lot of that dynamism out of it but also it they become so absurdly technical that even people who train the sport are not really able to appreciate what's going on mm. whereas with nogi um, these sort of things can happen but they're not quite as minute so to speak i like the adcc rule set mm. there is that there, there will never be a perfect rule set but i think it's pretty cool yeah I mean, and it's interesting that uh, when Sheikh Tanun set up the ADCC, he did it because he wanted to create a platform where Samboists and judo players and wrestlers could come and fight within a rule set with Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys yeah. to see who was best and not be disadvantaged. It's just kind of shows how what a great sport Brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah, is. That we don't that, have any. That it's ended up being, you know... I mean, look, that wasn't helped by the International Judo Federation banning their their top flight judo players from fighting professionally. So uh, judo, you know, active judo competitors are not allowed to compete in ADCC? I don't know currently exactly what the rule set is, but that's what I'm, that that's what I think, yes. I mean, we, we certainly had, I think it's, um, it kind of reminds me of, uh, I'm not sure why this analogy has popped up into my head, but it sort of reminds me of Strongman in a way. Mm -hmm. Whereas back in the day, sort of 20 years ago, World's Strongest Man was this real uh, kind of chaotic smorgasbord of different strength sports. They'd be doing sumo and they'd be doing arm wrestling and they'd be pulling boats on pulleys and stuff like that. And as time has gone, it's become a lot more... Um, it's been like, you know, now there's, it's Atlas Stones, log press, uh, squat, deadlift. It's become a lot less uh, random in mm. the sort of things that they do. And when I think about uh, ADCC, you look back there even, you know, obviously 20, you know, 15 years ago when it started, 20 years ago, I think, uh, when, when the first one was. I think it was 96. Yeah. I could be wrong. I think it was 96. Yeah. So, you know, you look, you, you look back to, to the early or even 10 years ago. There would, st and even even less than that, to be honest, you would see MMA fighters, you know, current UFC fighters in there. You'd see some wrestlers in there. And now you look at ADCC now and you're going, well, it's pure jujitsu people. And it kind of makes sense because it's, jujitsu is so much more popular and the skill of the athletes is so much higher above any of these other sports that if you had someone who wasn't pure jujitsu in, then you wouldn't have the best jujitsu people there. Mm. So it kind of, uh, it makes it, it takes out some of that 
sort of exciting chaos of having uh, GSP in it or uh, other MMA fighters that we've seen in ADCC in the past. And and while we're on this subject, did you see Danaher's poach, post about uh, uh, Nicholas Merengeli uh, uh, and, and about the fact that he hadn't trained any no-gi and that he didn't have any takedowns? Yes. Well, what's your opinion about that? Well, I, I think I saw your comment on that, uh, which was basically calling bullshit. There's no way that he got to his level without ever taking the gi off. Do you know what? You've misinterpreted my comment. I... I was literally shocked because I'm, I will. It, look, you think that's true though? I don't know. I wouldn't imagine that Danaher is someone that is, I think that he's so exacting in everything that he does. I think that he's potentially telling the truth or, or, or close or very close. And what I felt was interesting, my comment on Facebook actually was more saying, I don't really understand yeah. a world in which, a jiu-jitsu fighter can go from white belt to black belt meddling at IBJJF Worlds and, and Nicholas gold meddling at IBJJF Worlds and not be exposed. What sort of jiu-jitsu academies are, are not exposing their athletes to no gi and a certain amount of judo? I mean, I, it just doesn't compute for me. We were always told coming through you should be doing no gi once a week. Um, we were always told you need to, if possible, at least cross train in judo. And if you can't cross train in judo or wrestling, then at least take the, you know, the, 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 the standing warm ups that we do yeah. seriously. And, at, you know, at Carlson Gracie team in London, the Saturday class starts standing every round starts standing. Yeah. Um, do you, you know. do, do you implement that rule to this day that every single one of your students does at least one no gear week? It's not a rule. It's standing up at the end of the class and saying, guys, if you want to get good at Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you need to do a minimum of one day per week, no gi. If, even if you only want to train gi, you need to do one day a week of no gi because it will be good for your gi because you will learn so much more about body positioning yeah. about weight distribution because you can't just grab some fabric yeah, tightness and, yeah, yeah. And, and, and hold on for dear life and so i very much see it as part of the system and and furthermore to that where i used to say to them you need to do gi uh, you need to do no gi one day per week now i'm saying to them listen guys if you prefer no gi because you find it, it exciting no problem yeah. But make sure you do one gi class per week. Yeah. You know. So do you believe that um do you believe that training no gi well, it seems like you do, but I, I I guess is it does it work equally both ways? Do you think that training gi helps your no gi as much as no gi helps your gi? I'm listen, here's the thing. Chris Thompson, I know you're listening to this and you're gonna flame me because <laughs> me and you don't agree on this subject. Yeah. By the way, Hats off to Darren Morris and Chris Thompson. What Absolutely. On, on Grapple Fest. Fest, yeah. Just while we're on the subject. Yep. Amazing. Yeah. Chris has very, uh, very public, public views on this. Yes. And he feels that there is absolutely no point in training gi if you want to be good at no gi. Um, and I some jiu-jitsu instructors say there's no point training no gi. What I would say is this. I, I don't, th again, there's shades of grey. I don't think it's black and white. And what I would say is this. I think that there are elements in no gi that are good for gi. Like the fact that when you take your gi off, you have to learn to distribute your weight properly. You have because you haven't got the hips that you can hold on to yeah. and the underhook where you fed the lapel mm -hmm. through underneath and grabbed it and you're holding side control. You can't do that. You've got to distribute your weight properly. Um, and so that's why gi players can benefit from playing no gi. And I think that that no gi players can benefit from from training with the gi because when you're training no gi, you can rely on a certain amount of explosiveness and athleticism to escape. Now, just by putting the gi on every now and then, you're not going to lose your ability to escape when mm. you take the gi off using athleticism and and slipperiness, okay? But what you're also going to do is you're going to learn how to escape when someone's got hold of a bit of fabric here and a bit of fabric there. And if you have both types of escapes available to you, it mm. makes you a better no-gi player. So I, I'm not going to say that they should be done equally. I think that if you enjoy training no-gi most, yeah. 
And that's where you're going to base your competition career. You should be doing one day a week of gi, yeah. okay, just as a training tool. And I think that if you're, if it's the opposite way around and you prefer doing gi and that's and you're going to do IBJJF one day a week of no gi. I, and I, just, I see that the same as the fact that, you know, an MMA fighter is not always going to fight with six ounce gloves on. Yeah. They're going to go and box with boxing gloves on. And there isn't this mindset of, oh, you can't put the boxing gloves on because that's not how you, that's not what you're going to be fighting in. The boxing gloves are just a tool. Yeah. They're just a tool for learning. Um, so I don't think it's as black and white as gi, no gi guys don't need to do gi. I think that it, it could be a helpful tool as long as you don't do too much of it. Yeah, I think uh, I'm inclined to agree with that there. Yeah, which people may be surprised at because usually they are, are shit on the gear uh, any opportunity possible. I've, I've put together a good argument there, Daniel. <laughs> no, 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 I agree. Yeah. I, I, and I do think so. I just, uh, I, and, and it kind of goes back to something we were talking about earlier. I find that the gi is um, more injury prone for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 100%. I and, agree with you. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it because your hands actually don't look your hands don't look super mangled. I mean, my hands are super pretty because I don't train in the gear at all. Um, but when I was, I was still coming up with some strategies to try and reduce the negative effects that it had. I mean, I, I don't know if you ever remember Nick's hands. I mean, Nick, Nick's hands were so bad that they, they were actually on a T-shirt. Uh, someone took a picture of them and they were sort of so ugly they by were the used way, as a demonstrator. By the way, Dickie's hands aren't, uh, they're, you know, they're not, gonna, they're not an oil painting. Yeah, I know? mean, Nick, Nick had like uh, four knuckles on each knuckle. It was absolutely horrendous. Uh, are there any strategies in particular or tips or tricks for trying to keep your fingers in best condition possible when you're doing gi i've got the best tip in the world go on let go no go on top position smash <laughs> <laughs> basically don't play god god exactly. is where you're, god you're is where looking your fingers at my fingers yeah. well guess what i don't play god unless i have to yeah i play my, look i'm very very old school and it doesn't matter i'm 53 years old yeah i'm not saying it's what everyone should do now i'm a dinosaur but here's how jiu-jitsu works for me I play top position unless I get put into guard. Yeah. If I get put into guard, my guard's okay. Yeah. It's going to do the job. I need to sweep and sub or submit, right? But I'm potentially, unless it's, you know, that's not where I want to be. I want to be passing. And what that's done is the byproduct of that mindset means that my fingers have survived a little bit longer. Mm. The other reason why my fingers don't look like Nick Brooks's Rest in peace, Nick. We miss you, dude. Uh, or or Dicky Martins is because uh, I'm not a full time instructor. Sure. So I'm. But here's the other big thing. I get loads of people asking me this in my classes at the end of class. And Simon, can I just? I've got a question. My fingers are really starting to hurt. And you know what my answer is? Take two weeks off. Mm. Not jujitsu. Take two weeks off training with the gi and go and do every single no gi class. Sure. The moment your fingers start to hurt, it's telling you you're doing too much gi. Yeah, go train advice, no gi. Yeah. And by the way, and that's what I did when I was coming through the ranks. Whenever my fingers started hurting, I just increased the amount of no gi I was doing and decreased the amount of gi I was doing. And back in those days at Carlson's, there was, you know, there was only one specific no gi class per week, but it was completely acceptable. You know, we were talking about at the beginning of the fight, what are your injuries and mm. are you all right with heel hooks? At the beginning of the fight, do you mind, I'm going to take the coat off. Can we do no gi? Yeah. That was completely acceptable, which I know wouldn't be in, in 90% of jiu-jitsu academies, but because the Carlson Gracie ethos was very kind of, you know, it, you know, Carlson's was, it was a fighter mentality, it, it, right? Exactly. And and Wilson came from Luta Livre. Fifty percent of our fifty percent of our students were wanting to be MMA fighters. You know, I'm not saying that any of them made it big, but the, there was as many people who wanted to go and fight in MMA at Carlson's back in the early noughties yeah. as there were people that wanted to go and fight in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitions. Really? Yeah. Um and you know, and and going back to that time as well, we're talking about leg locks, I just suddenly had this thought that that something else I should mention about leg locks was, and I think I mentioned this in our last podcast, when Wilson started work, working the doors, he gave me the no gi class on the Sunday to teach, um, which was a massive honour. I was a purple belt. I was a brand new purple belt. Um, I like to think I was a decent purple belt. When I got my purple, I mean, you know. I managed to win a European uh, championship in the Masters division. So my purple, I was I was a decent purple belt. Mm. 
And he gave me the job of running the no-gi class. Now, interestingly, on the Sunday, there was no uh, classes at, at London Shoot Fighters. And so we used to get anyone that wanted to train from Shoot Fighters, it was five quid to turn up on Sundays and do the no-gi class at Carlson's. And of course, firstly, they'd come because they wanted to train. Secondly, they'd come because, you know, they thought it, it was excellent sport coming trying to smash up some Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys, you know. Um, and thirdly... We were very, very close to them. We were within a mile, maybe half a mile. Mm. And so, you know, one of the people that I used to have wars with every Sunday was James Zickich, uh -huh. who, was, who was my weight and was a proper, He's proper a beast. handful. Yep. He was a handful. And me and James used to just bounce each other off the walls. You know, thank goodness he wasn't allowed to punch me. Otherwise, <laughs> I wouldn't still be here. You know, it was lucky it was grappling yeah. rules. I'm not, you know, I, by the way, you know, I've got so much respect for that dude. Yeah. So much, he's a tough, tough man. Mm. At the time, under Brazilian jiu-jitsu rules, me and, me and him were hanging. We were, we were very, very similar at grappling. And, um, but, but the point that I'm making is, is that we would have all of these London shoot guys turning up and, and leg locks would, would de rigueur, you know, it's, it's what Paul and Alexis were teaching them. Yeah. You know, the London shoot guys were very, very good at leg locks around that time. They were, yeah. And way, way, way ahead of the Way ahead of the yeah. game. Way, you know, because they had that kind of Japanese, uh, you know, pancreas And they had, mentality. they had, they had, uh, you know, it was MMA. They were, yeah. they, it was everything goes. Yeah. Exactly. So we were very, very exposed at Carlson's. We were lucky with that you know, where it was probably different from the average sort of gi Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academy in London at that point. Mm. And, uh, you, you know, you, something that we you mentioned earlier and I wanted to get back to, um, talking about uh, no-gi grading. What's mm. your thoughts on it? If you'd have asked me this in the previous time, when, yeah. we, when, when we sat down six years ago, I, probably, I was probably starting to ha be more open-minded at that point. And, but I... My old school mentality was this Nelson Solari. When you take the belt, when you take the belt off, there are no grades. Sure. And that mentality was, you know, the, you know, it's kind of like you take the belt off. There are no rules with regards leg locks. Sure. There are no rules with regards grades. You know, it everything changes. And what I would say now is, I would say that for jiu-jitsu to develop, we have to accept that no gi is as important as gi. Mm. For the whole revolution of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, for the spectator side of it, for everything, and I think that it's healthy. I think that it's he I think that grading people is it lets people know what their level is. Mm -hmm. I think that they need to know. They need, you know. I think that some people don't. Some people just want to treat no gear as a sport uh, uh, and treat it. Uh, you know, you don't get graded if you go and play basketball or soccer. What's the point? Mm. But then we are still doing a martial art and we do still train it in a, you know, in a certain way. And so I don't have any problem with with no gear grades. And what I would say is, you know, whenever I've rolled with the tenth planet black belt, they're black belts, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and what I would say is, is that, you know, you put a 10th planet black belt in a gi, he's still going to be decent. He's not going to be as good in the gi as he is no gi. But by the same token, if you have one of these black belts that has only ever really trained in the gi and you take his gi off, right? He's not going to be as good, but he's still going to be hang, black yeah. belt level. He's still going to be able to hang there. Of course, there's going to be differences because we're going to be good at what we prioritize. But I'm not going to be so close minded and old school as to say no gi grading is a bad idea. Mm. I think that we have to accept that the game is changing and we have to embrace it and we have to look forward. You know, nothing, nothing good comes from looking behind. Yeah. You know. We've got to keep looking forward. And as a sport, we've got to keep marching forward. And when it develops, we've got to be open-minded about it. And, you know, and here's the thing. I respect, I, I respect anyone that does no gi. Um, and, I, and I've never seen someone who's been graded and you go, what's that grade? A black belt no gi, whether it's from the Raspberry Ape system or the, or, or, or the 10th Planet system or whatever, they're generally very, very good at jiu-jitsu. Sure, yeah. I'm not going to argue with it, you know. So and it's just it's just they're prioritizing yeah. different things. So do, do you have anyone at Carlson who trains only no gear? Freddy? Just Freddy? Fred, Fred Fred Well, look, everyone at Carlson's puts the gear on sometimes. Freddy puts the gear on okay. sometimes. But by the way, he's got a little room full of monsters train prioritizing 
no gi. We, but, and you know, and we've, you look, look, I've just, I just promoted uh, Akil and Rowan Bist to Black Belt and they've only trained no gi for the last three or four years uh-huh. and I've just given them Black okay. Belts. Okay, yes. Yeah, so and when, that, and when I awarded them the Black Belts, yeah. they they put their gis on and they received their gis in the black belt. Yeah. You'll never ever see them wearing those gis. Yeah. They're, they're, they're in there with Freddie, you know, going X guards to heel hook, mm. you know, uh, you know, really, really playing a very, yeah. very modern game. And both of them were junior champions in, 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 uh, in judo, mm. you know, so I got those, those, those two young men I got when they were 12 and 14 wow. years old. And they were, uh, they were international level junior judo players. They came because their father wanted me to, uh, wanted Carlson Gracie team to get their Nawaza up to standard. Yeah. It backfired. <laughs> and, I've, and I apologize to their father. And they quit the judo. It backfired. They quit the judo within a year and went crazy on jujitsu. And now they're completely immersed in no gi. And Freddie's yeah. got, Freddie's got 25 to 30 people in his no gi class at Carlson's. Mm who are massively prioritizing no gi mm. and very rarely they'll put the gi on if it's like Wednesday night and there isn't a no gi class and they think shit I missed the Tuesday night no sure. gi class or whatever they'll put a gi on to come training but it's not what they want to be doing yeah um, but it works well it's good yeah I mean do, do, do you know how my no gi grading system worked remind me so i i had it's a completely different color scheme and a different number so i basically the way that i saw it was that um whilst it kind of goes against the tradition um i didn't see any reason that someone who didn't train in the gi i mean there's no reason to have a grade right that it's just something that we like to do to, so this progression it's a tradition um but 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 it doesn't have a huge amount and it lets you know which division you're going to compete in and it gives you a goal to work towards and i thought all of those things are equally true for someone who trains just no gi so i brought in a a a no gi grading system i use sweat bands around the ankles so it's something that you can wear every you know yeah people can see people people, know where people can see and 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 for me i i think the reason why grade should exist is one you went white yellow orange or something like that yeah it's like judo it's white yellow green red yeah um and 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 i had four instead of five because what i didn't want someone to do is i didn't want someone to go if i just had five belts that are different colors you could kind of transpose them directly over to the gi and you could go i'm a purple belt in the gi i feel like i should be a yellow band i didn't want anyone to do that so i had a different number of them um and uh so, so so no one could kind of have any um entitlement to what they felt that they did obviously that still happens sometimes when someone's a purple belt and they give them a white band they're not very happy but that's on them um but 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 it works and i think actually something uh in, in, there's lots of reasons for having grades and i think all of those reasons are just as true no gears they are gi especially when you're running a, a no gi program with a lot of people you know that 50 percent of the people that i was teaching did not train any gi not mm-hmm. not because we had a a, a, a no gi only uh, membership a gi only membership and a combined membership and of the people who trained no gi with me about 50 percent of them were part of the combined and 50 percent of them were, were pure no gi they just had no interest in it and uh and, and it worked well and 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 you know it, it lets you know if they're wearing a white band and they start trying to give you advice take it with a pinch of salt but if they're wearing a red band and they're trying to give you advice then then they know exactly what they're talking about and stuff like that and then you know even to i think there's actually i think that jiu-jitsu tends to underutilize grading like they, they they i think that there's a lot more potential for functionality with the grades uh in terms of uh specific sparring or constraint based sparring and stuff like that where the discrepancies between grades will give a, a force different start positions or different rule sets and stuff like that so it's something uh eventually when i when i find someone that open up that i'll be looking to do more of but i think that there's more we can use the grading system as something more functional to advance our training than purely i've been training for this amount of time and i'm this good no, I agree. I, yeah. You know, and the thing is, as I say, I'm becoming more open minded. I used to have a very old school attitude, which came from being taught by Brazilians who were, who, you know, who were absolutely uh, locked into their thought processes about what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu should be and, and what it is. 
things are changing. We all have yeah. to change. We have to adapt. We have to develop as jujitsu adapts and develops. And yeah. that's what's beautiful about it. It's never ending. It's infinite. Yeah. And that's what I say to my class. Listen, guys, no one knows the whole system. And guess what? Anyone that thinks they knows the whole system, there's a kid somewhere in, in Milton Keynes in a garage and he's just developed a new, a, a new submission. Yeah. You know, hundred percent, you know, that, that, that's what's great about jujitsu. Um, you know, so, so kind of moving on from that, and uh, I say what kind of the introduction is just a simple hour gone there. Um, but I, you know, we haven't, we haven't spoken in a long time. Like you were saying, a lot of things have changed, not only in jujitsu, but also in life in general. And obviously I've been following you over COVID and stuff like that. And you seem to have had like, you had, you had quite a transformation. I can't remember whether it was prior to COVID or during COVID. You seem to be, obviously you've always been on your bike, but you seem to be doing super long distance cycling now. Or you were over COVID or prior to COVID, you were doing some really long distance stuff. Tell me a bit about that. What happened was, and anyone that's listened to that Origin podcast, number three, um, understands that I've been at work since I was 16 years old. And I put everything into my career. And any energy that I didn't have for my career straight went straight into training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm. And, you know, and, and I actually got a motorcycle just so that I could finish work at 8 PM on a film set, which is when you generally finish work in those days. Mm. And I could ride half an hour from anywhere in London, get to Carlson Gracie team and at least get there for the last 30 minutes of sparring. Yeah. Um, and so I've literally just made films and done Jiu Jitsu and haven't had much time for anything else. And I, and what, what COVID did for me, I was determined to make COVID work for me. Mm. I was determined not to let this beat me down. I saw it as, I almost saw it as a challenge of, yeah. right, okay, so this is what you, you want to lock down? You, you know, you, you're telling me I can't go to work, you know? I was about to start a film and that went away. Suddenly my whole life is on hold. I'm being told that, you know, I can't do Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which we need to talk about in a minute with regards to the UK BJJA and yeah. stuff. But it was basically a big shock. And the first thing that I did was I thought, and I'm going to be, and I'm going to be honest here, I'll probably get flamed for this. And there's going to be some people that really, really followed the lockdown rules absolutely to the letter. Um, I, I did my own version of lockdown. Okay. I mean, you, 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 are, this is a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu podcast. I think mm. if there's a demographic of, of people who didn't quite follow the lockdown rules, hundred percent, you, you're probably talking to the right crowd, but so, anyway. So, so look, I did my own version of lockdown. I think that what I did was responsible. I don't think I put anyone at risk, but there was no way I was just going to stay in my house until yeah. the government told me I was allowed out. And so what I did was I decided that I was going to concentrate on things that I had always wanted to do, but hadn't really had the time. And about 10 years previously, I'd had a brief flirtation with a road bike and I'd ridden a few times around Richmond Park. That's a funny story, actually. Dickie started riding the road bike to get fit for the Worlds, which, as you know, he won. He's got three Masters gold medals in black belt division. And road cycling was a big part of that. We live right close to Richmond Park, which is a great place to ride mm. on a bicycle. And, and Dickie had we, – we had a mate who was, uh, who was a, 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 a bicycle coach. He was good at teaching people to ride road bikes. And Dickie said, look, you've got to come and do this with us. I'm getting pretty good at it. You know, it's, it's really good fun. And me th thinking I'm an ex-BMX champion, I'm good at cycling. Yeah. And I thought, I'm going to go out and smash these guys. So I went out with Dickie and this, this bloke, and we, we, we rode off together in Richmond Park. And the bicycle coach said to me, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? And he said, w why are you in that gear? And I said, what gear? This is the right gear. He said, mate, you're riding that bike all wrong. Now, of course, I was incredibly insulted. And I thought, <laughs> who the hell is this telling me how to ride a bike? And what I was doing was I was using my quad muscles and my glutes, and my hamstrings, and I was grinding. Mm. Now, what's interesting about cycling is this, um, and I found this out later. You don't use your leg muscles like that because here's the thing. You've got a finite amount of energy per yeah. day in your legs. As you well know, once you've hit failure, you can't go again. There isn't a version of, I can do one more rep. You failed. Yeah. Your heart and your lungs never get to failure unless you die, right? Got you. Your heart and your lungs are designed 
to be able to recover. Mm. You can go 100% with your cardio, pull back a little bit, keep on going, your heart rate comes down, mm. you get oxygen back into your red blood cells, you're back, you can go more. And so what I had tried to do with BMX being an anaerobic sport that only lasts 40 seconds or 50 seconds in a BMX race was I tried to get on a road bike and ride it like it was a BMX bike. And we were going to do three laps of the park, which by the way is nothing. It's like 20, it's, it's like 18 miles, mm. which on a road bike is nothing. And halfway around the first lap, I was four miles in and they basically dropped me. Dickie and the bike coach dropped me. And dr wow. dropping someone on a, on a bicycle means you're just left behind. Yeah. And you don't, they don't wait for you, right? That's not how it works. You get dropped. See and once you get dropped, you can't get back, yeah. right? And so I went home, <laughs> put the bike in the garage and never rode it again. Anyway, when lockdown came around, I thought, I'm going to get that bike out because I've got to get out. And they say that I can do an, an hour cycling per day. So I went out and I rode to Box Hill, which for me at that point, that was a long way. It was out into Surrey, but I thought I've got to, I can't be cooped up at mm. home. And I actually, I actually photocopied the lockdown rules and laminated them and put them in my rucksack so that it, and by the way, they were guidelines. As far as I remember, they were guidelines, not laws. And I had this laminated bit of paper ready to show the police to say, look, I'm only an hour from Richmond and I'm allowed to do this, you know, mm. and I haven't, and I'm not, and I, do you see anyone else? I'm mm. on my own. I'm not putting anyone at risk. I'm not stopping anywhere. Okay. I'm out on my own. Um, and I'm allowed to do this exercise. So I had this big speech ready. The police never stopped me. <laughs> yeah. So, but I went to Box Hill and I rode up Box Hill, which by the way, I found out later, Box Hill isn't that big a deal. But at the time it's like, I rode my bike up Box Hill. It was miles away. And I got home and I thought, that was great. I felt really, really good. And it was a time for me to clear my mind. And it was also the opposite of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in that I didn't have this competitive ego involved whereby, you know, there's stress when you're, when you're, when you're sparring with people yeah. because you don't want to get tapped. You know, you, let's face it. And so coming from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is an incredibly competitive sport, even if you're just training it, Right, even if you're just in the gym, at least the way I do it, it is. And you know, I mean, just, it, it, it's it's direct competition. You've yes. got you've got direct competition. You've got indirect competitions. Indirect competition, something like tennis, and, where it's against yeah. someone, but you're not actually. And, and going, when I say that, that, yeah, if you listen to this and you think, well, hang on a minute, he should be leaving his ego at the door. All I'm going to no, say, no, that's the whole point. All of the I'm going to say is this: there are times when you drive home from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and you feel great, and there are other times where you feel shit. Right. Everyone can admit that. And if you can't yeah. admit that, then you're lying, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I went out on my bike, got home, and just thought that was incredible. Mm. And I did it, and I don't feel that tired. And so the next week, I thought, right, I, you know what I'm going to do? I, I think I'm pretty good at this. I'm going to ride to Brighton and back. Yeah. And How I many got, miles is that? I got 115. Yeah, okay, so wait. So, so the, <laughs> my first ride out to Box Hill and back was like, it was, it was 40 miles. Okay. You know, it was okay. decent. It was a decent It's ride. a big step up though. Yeah. Yeah. The next week, I got in touch with my mate who had been road cycling for 20 years, who I grew up with. Thank you, Dan Bronx. And uh, and said, right, you know, I'm going to do this Brighton ride. And he said, well, look, mate, you've got to get these things called gels, which are basically carbohydrates mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a fructose where you just, and, you know, and you've got to make sure that you have a gel every 40 minutes. And it's all about keeping the calories coming in and all of this stuff. So I, I went and did it got all the way to, to Brighton, rode home again. The next morning, and it was hard, Dan, mm. it was really, really hard. Because to get to Brighton from, from London, you've got to go over the North Downs, which are these massive hills on the edge of South London. And then you've got to go on the South Downs, uh, you've got to go over the South Downs, which are the massive hills on the edge of Brighton. Mm. And when you come back, you've got to do the same thing again. And so by the time you've got home, you've basically done the same elevation as riding from sea level to a ski resort wow. okay you've done a you've you've done about two thousand meters mad so i did it and i phoned or i whatsapp dan the next day and i said i did it i went to brighton and back and dan whatsapp me and said what do you mean and back <laughs> and i said yeah brighton and back i told you i was going to do it and he said dude people only ride to brighton they get the train back and that and so basically i completely so screwed it, it up and, yeah but the reality was i smashed it 
So, and, and I really, really loved it. And it was, and I was on my own. Um, and it was just a time to be a little bit introspective and mm. think about things. And there was all of that shit going on with COVID. You know, none of us knew whether we were going to live or die or whether it was all, whether it was all a big, uh, you know, a yeah. big false flag. We, none of us really knew what was going on. It was a weird on. time. It was I a mean, weird no one, time. No one can deny that. And yeah. at that point, we weren't training. We, you know, we started later. I'll come to that later in the discussion. So I went and I, I rode to Brighton and back. And then the next weekend, I thought I did that easy. I'm going to go to Bognor Regis and back this weekend. Not because I wanted to go to Bognor Regis because it's it's not a very nice beach. No. But because I didn't re- – what I – would and by the way, I'm going to sound really old now, but I – always driven through these areas in the countryside at high speed either in a hot hatch yeah. or later on in a sports car or on a motorcycle at x amount of miles per hour i'm not going to say because i don't want the police knocking at my door but yeah, yeah, yeah. right that's how I, that's how simon hayes knew the countryside right via a blur it was a blur <laughs> And what I realized was I must be getting old because I was getting out into the countryside on my bicycle and I loved it. And it was, I've been stuck in a dojo for the last 20 years Mm. or stuck on a a film film set set with no windows. And it was like, literally, this is just, I I didn't realize what I was missing. And I wanted to ride down to Bognor Regis because it skirts Surrey and Hampshire. And it was a part of the countryside, which I'd never really got to know very well. Mm. And by the way, I did it and it was beautiful. But the reason I'm mentioning Bognor is because I got back as far as Dorking. Now, Dorking's still quite a long way from London, right? And I did this thing that cyclists call bonking, which is where you run out of, uh, of calories. You've okay. basically, you've taken your eye off the ball. You've got so low, low down on blood sugar that it doesn't matter how many gels you now eat. It's you're, game you're, over. You're gone. You, yeah. You're gone, right? And I got to Dorking and I got off the bike just... And I started crying, right? I was all on my own and I, and I had tears streaming. Down. And, I, and my missus has already said to me, I don't approve of you going out. You should, you know, this isn't, this isn't within the rules of lockdown, Simon, what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, Simon, it's an hour of exercise. And you, anyway. How, so, how long were you cycling for sort of continuously by the time you, 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 your, uh, I think your body it, shuts it, down? It, it took me about, I think it took me about five and a half hours to get to Bognor. Okay. And, and then, I, and I'd been cycling four and a half hours to get back to Dorking. So, so I'm like an hours. hour from home. I'm an hour, 90 minutes from home. And I got to Dorking and I, sh- and I had nothing left. Wow. And I couldn't phone the missus <laughs> and say, can you come and pick me up? That's what the tears are for. <laughs> Mainly because of the ego, right? And because of the bollock, the impending bollocking. Right? She was going to use that against you right? for the rest of your life. And the whole rules of lockdown. And, okay. and just so many different reasons I couldn't phone, right? Yeah. And so then I thought, well, Perhaps if I lie down on the on, on the grass. So I lay down on the grass and I immediately started going to sleep. And I thought, shit, I can't do this because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to wake up at five o'clock in the morning in, in freezing cold, shivering, in an even oh, worse state than I'm yeah, in now. Yeah, yeah. And so I literally got back on the bike and there were tears streaming down. <laughs> I was thinking, how? And I cried from all the way from Dorking to Chessington, right? Anyone that knows that that area knows that that's, that's a decent... That's a decent distance for a grown man to have tears streaming down <laughs> his, his cheeks. And then when I got to the A3, which basically it's an A road, but it's a three-lane motorway. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's just not classed as a motorway. I was supposed to wind my way back through Surbiton and Kingston. and blah. I went straight down the A3 on the, on the hard shoulder, <laughs> the most direct route to London. You know, trucks beep, beep, beep yeah. as they're passing me. And I'm thinking, fuck you, I'm going home. <laughs> um, so I, I learned my lesson. Um, and then eventually, a year later, uh, you know, I'd fallen in love with cycling. I'd also, at that point, we were back in the gym. We were training. You know, we were doing the, you know, the the, the legal training with which the UK BJJA negotiated mm. on our behalf, which was for the elite program. And uh, and but I but I'd fallen in love with cycling, and I cycled to Stonehenge and back in a day, wow. which was which took me twenty one hours. Wow, uh, that's two hundred and four miles. Which which we did, we, you know, we were, a few things went wrong with punctures and stuff on the way down. Did you do there. that alone? Uh, I did that with two other dudes. I did that with Byron, who's who's my daughter's boyfriend. Uh, big up Byron. He's just gone pro in boxing. Wow. Who's got absolutely no bike skills whatsoever. Has never ridden a, a bicycle as a kid. Cardio for days, right? Cardio for days and just will Li- not literally quit. cardio will not for quit. days. Yeah. And times where and by the way, Byron and me have done a lot of training together. I'm also his jujitsu coach, but he's prior. To, I'll tell you about why he's into boxing in a sec, but he prioritizes boxing now. And and Byron knows me deeply and, and he's the little fucker 
who says to me, you know, he'll see when I'm on the edge of quitting mm. and he's like, what are you, a man or a mouse? Come on, me and you, we, we're going to smash this. And like, So he's almost like when I've got no ego left yeah. and I'm ready to give in, he's the guy, you know, he's in his early 20s and oh, he's just awesome, got, man. and he just pushes me and that's how we are with each other, you know. Um, whenever there's a hill, he wants to race up the hill. Yeah. You know, it's just, and it's horrible because I never want to lose. Yeah. Right. And I'm much, because of the BMX background, You've got that I'm sprint much, power, much better yeah. on a bicycle than him, but he's a 23 year old or however old he is, yeah. pro boxer, um, cardio for days, but also doesn't want to lose. He doesn't want to lose anything, that mm. dude. And the reason why he's, he, he's, he got into boxing was because we met in jujitsu and he came to me and said, look, I, what, I really like this but I want to be an MMA fighter. Mm. What do you suggest I do? And I said, but Byron, what I would suggest is right now, stay away from the MMA class because you're not good enough at jiu-jitsu and you're basically going to become a jack of all trades. Mm. You'll have average jiu-jitsu because he'd only just started. He was still a white belt on jiu-jitsu. He was a good white belt because he, he's a game scrapper. You know, he wants to win. Very good white belt, but he's a white belt. And and I it, it concerned me that this dude had so much talent but I didn't think the MMA class was the right place for him. So I said, what I would like you to do is to go and find a wrestling class, um, which, by the way, we have at Carlson's with a very, very good instructor. I want you to go wrestling and I want you to go and find an amateur boxing club mm. and go and start amateur boxing. He went amateur boxing and just fell in love with it. And so now he kind of does jiu-jitsu once every sort of 10 days or something like that, but has has got so good at, at boxing that he's just gone pro wow. under the Warrens. So he's done really, really well, you know, big up Byron. Yeah. So, I mean, the, 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 the super long distance cycling stuff is really interesting. So that's something that is really new to you, yeah. even though, which is really, it's cause like, I've got bike skills, but I that's it. And, yeah. and, and by the way, wh when I started reading about cycling, what I realized was there was this massive shift in, in the thought process about cycling around about the Lance Armstrong time where Lance, when Lance started, started being good at cycling was around about the time where there was suddenly there was more science involved and there was a massive more biology specifically. In cycling. Yeah. And, and, and rather than it's like with anything with, with jujitsu, with weight training there, it always, it was always just old school, old wives tales. Well, why do you do three sets? Well, because that's what my mate does and he's big. Mm. right well you know why do you you know why don't why do you say you shouldn't train no gi whatever and in cycling it was always that real men use big gears and you know if you're a real man if you grind and what lance's generation did was they actually started testing themselves with computers with vo2 maxes and they realized something that was just an evolution in cycling and that is You've got a finite amount of watts that you can put through your legs in a day. When they're gone, your, your legs aren't going to recover until you've been to sleep and woken up the next day. Yeah. So far better to spin an easier gearing and to not put your muscles under that much pressure and instead put your heart and lungs under pressure. Mm. Now, as I said earlier, that's not so comfortable because as you're riding, you're gassing. And so it, I can tell instantly when I, when I look at someone riding down the road, whether they're a real cyclist or not, because people that are, don't understand cycling, proper road cycling, will always be grinding too hard a gear yeah. because it's more comfortable using the leg muscles. What they don't realize, and by the way, that works fine if you're only going to do 20 miles, Yeah, right? Your leg muscles will be fine for 20 miles. But when you want to start doing 50, 60, 70, 100 or 200 miles, you've really got to spin an easy gear, keep your cadence up, okay, and let your heart and lungs do the work because they are designed to recover. Mm. And there is, you know, this is something that I thought I knew about health and fitness and it was a, it opened a completely new mindset for me. And so that's how you do big miles on a bicycle. You make sure that you're having calories going in at least every 40 minutes. And whatever gear, if you're starting out cycling, whatever gear you think you should be in, you should probably be in too easier and wow. just spin. And when you feel yourself get out of breath, just be thankful because getting out of breath isn't a big deal. That's the goal. That's the goal, exactly. Mm. And psychologically... You know, what are you doing for five, 10, 20 hours on a bike? Is it, 
is, is it music? Is it podcasts? Is it audio books or is it silence? Like what's going on there? Cause I find that fascinating. When I ride to work, it's, when I ride to work, it's news on the way to work because I've started riding to work. Now how how well. long does that take you? An hour. Okay. And I smash it, right? Because I know it's only an hour effort, I go as fast as I can. Yeah. And when I arrive at work, I'm in pieces. Yeah. You saw me fall off the leg press machine today. Yeah. That's pretty much how I get off a bicycle when I arrive at work. Yeah. I'm dripping in sweat. Yeah. I have smashed myself to smithereens. Yeah. And then I go and I, I go and have a quick shower. I arrive at my mixing desk where I'm not going to move for the whole day mm. and I've done my work. And I know that it's legitimate work that I've done. Mm. I've put in 100%. I've got a heart rate monitor on. I know exactly what I'm doing uh, scientifically and I'm taking myself to the limit of what I can do. So on the way to work, it's news because I like to keep up. You know, Again, I'm getting old. I want to know what's going on in the world. And then on the way home, it'll be a podcast. Yeah. You know, Generally, yourself or Rogan, something, you know, generally, I want something easy to listen to and generally something about MMA or jiu-jitsu. Yeah. But then when I go out on the long rides, um, either with my mates or on my own, there's nothing in my ears at all. Really? I, you know, when I did Brighton and, I, uh, and back on my own, I wasn't listening to anything. I don't listen to music because I think it's a little bit dangerous. You need to be aware of your surroundings. And I know that there's bone conductor headphones and stuff and all of that jazz. So, you know, but I, I, I actually really enjoy just being in my own thoughts. And I, and here's the thing. When I go on those long rides on my own, Brighton and back, I'm never thinking about cycling. And it's just me time. Mm. But what I've realized is throughout my life, there hasn't been a lot of me time. There's been a lot of making films. There's been a lot of doing jujitsu. I'm a guy that never really relaxes. And it's mm. almost sitting on that bicycle. Meditative. Is meditative. Yeah. And I can't sit on a sofa. Um, you know, I've just started doing yoga, which I'd like to talk about later. But yeah, so it's a meditative thing. And it's, I basically, I make plans. I set goals. I think about my career. I think about my relationships. I think about where I am in my life. I've always been a goal setter. Mm. And I think about, and I'm basically, I've got my life in front of me like a chessboard and I'm mapping out where the pieces are going to go and, and what I would do under any eventuality. And there's always something, you know, am I negotiating a new film? Should I be doing this film or that film? Or if I do that film, you know, you know, how's it going to affect my home life if I go away for five months and maybe I should take the one in the UK, whatever. So I'm basically setting goals. Um, I'm not so much setting jujitsu goals anymore because my competition career is over. Uh, listen, never say never. I yeah. may compete again, but it's not something that's in the forefront of my mind. With jujitsu, my goals right now are to just stay healthy and uh, uh, basically to stay healthy and stay on the mat. Mm. I used to take my son and my daughters to Paula Jala's judo class in the Budokai on a Sunday, which was kind of the teenage class. And we would have one end of the dojo. They'd be teaching one end of the dojo. And at the other end of the dojo, there was all of the old boys who were kind of fifth, sixth, seventh dans. Mm. And they are literally old men. They are in their late 70s and 80s and wow. potentially 90s. And they're just in there and they're doing Uchi Komi, which means drilling repetition work, just the entry to throws. And I just used to look at them and just go, that's the goal of yeah. Jiu Jitsu, to still be on the mat. On the mat in 70s, 80s, 90s. Absolutely. Yeah. And what I've started to realize with Jiu Jitsu in the last couple of, and by the way, I had a very, very good innings. You know, it was only when I kind of, I'm 53 now, it was only when I hit 51 where I started thinking, you're going to have to accept now that you're going to get tapped. You're going to have to accept that you're not going to win every round. Mm. You're going to have, and, and you know, to get to 51 before having that conversation with yourself, I think is a triumph. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm quite proud of that. But yeah. at 51, I started saying, this is now the time where you've got to accept that, you know, things, you can only do so much with this body. Um, and that's why also I'm trying to do other things and develop other 
other ways of keeping fit to keep me healthy for the mats. Yeah. Because now, by the way, my cardio right now, right now as we're speaking, my cardio is better than it's ever been. I've, I mean, you're doing 200 mile cycles. That's, my that's asthma no has surprise. disappeared. Yeah. I had, I've had asthma since I was four or five years old. Part of lockdown uh, and the cycling was I went on a very, very strict keto diet. Yeah, that's um, another thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Which, which, I, which was purely to get ripped. Um, I just for, for any know, reason. I was, what I was finding was I was I'm I'm five foot nine, five foot ten on a good day if I stand a little bit on my tiptoes. How tall are you? Because we're about the same size. You five find, nine. Okay, we're, I'm five nine. That's the reality of it. And uh, and when I was fighting properly in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you about per, ninety per, kilos, weren't belt. you? No, I wasn't. I was I was middle heavy. Okay, right? eighty four. Eighty four. Right. I found myself at kind of 48, 49 years old at 94 kilos. Yeah. Now, there's a big difference. 84, I was strong in shape. If I took my gear off, you'd go, he looks all right. He's in quite good nick. At 94, I looked like someone that used to do some weights but was holding a lot of fat. I don't know about that, Simon. You look pretty <laughs> damn built at 94 <laughs> kilos when I saw you. you. I don't think I've ever seen you since I started training where I've thought you don't look in good nick. So well, you're, 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 you're very critical you, of Dan. yourself, but yeah. Thank you. But anyway, I've, and what I found was I found myself passing the guard, which obviously is my speciality. Yeah. And rather than getting my grips, getting the underhook, getting the head control, getting a grip on, on, on the hips and then thinking, right, I'm going to take four deep breaths and then I'm going to go knee on chest and then I'm going to take two breaths and then I'm going to go to mount. I'd be getting to side control and I'd be thinking, right, I'm going to stay here for a minute and get my <laughs> breath back. And literally I'd say, <sighs> and I just realized that I was basically, uh, I was taking massive breaks yeah. in a round of jujitsu. I would get to a dominant position and I would literally have to get my breath back. Mm. And I realized that I was out of shape and unfit. I was too heavy. and I was heavier than I, than I should be for sure. what my physique is. Yeah. Um, and I was 94 kilos. And, I, and again, during lockdown, it was part of this great big reset. I thought, right, you lazy ass, you know, bitch, you've got to sort yourself out. And, and so I went on a – I knew that keto worked because I'd play, I've been playing with keto since the late 90s. Yeah. Um, when we called it Atkins or low carb. And, yeah. and I knew that it worked for me, but I'd never done it properly strictly. And at the beginning of lockdown, when I got on the bicycle, as well as riding the bike, I went on a very, very strict keto diet. Now you mm. can imagine with the bike rides and the keto, fat was just falling off me. I, I mean, I, I remember following you on, on online and you were just, it shredded. seemed like in, in a couple of months, you were just like in, in uh, yeah. 70 something kilos and absolutely ripped. Yeah. Yeah. shredded um better than i'd ever been what, what are you wearing now right now as we speak now is 82 yeah. which is which is a comfortable weight for me and i'm not shredded but my abs are, are in good nick yeah uh, you know I'm, I'm happy at 82 yeah something very very interesting for me personally when i was under 80 i was having trouble with heavyweights in jiu-jitsu yeah right you know big brown belts big purple belts it wasn't easy. Mm. The moment I actually came back into the 81s and 82s, it was like, okay, this is a what. And what I'm talking about is, you know, I would be going with someone that weighed 98 kilos, getting side control and have everything locked right. And they just literally bench yeah, press yeah, me yeah, off. Yeah. The moment I came back to 81, 82, yeah. I was all right again. Okay. And so I felt that my weight is stabilized now at that. I know that I can still fight at under 84 if I ever fancy competing, mm -hmm. which is good. Um, and I know that when I'm sparring with anyone in the gym, my weight isn't going to be detrimental to what I'm able to do. Yeah. Um, but I've still got my speed and my cardio. Yeah. So anyway, going back to this whole thing with the asthma and the keto, it wasn't keto which cured the asthma. What happened was as part of my keto diet, I obviously stopped eating grains and bread. Mm. And then I was driving somewhere um, to go and pick something up and I couldn't eat keto and I stopped at a little garage somewhere and all there was was a sandwich. And I'd noticed that my asthma had kind of was getting better and better and better and I was needing to take my inhaler less. And by the way, Dan, at Carlson's before this, when I was 94 kilos, Anyone that gets asthma knows knows what a Ventolin inhaler is. It's the it's it's the you know the greeny coloured one that yep. you see everyone take normally. 
I was, we'd do a six minute round at Carlson's and I'd have five puffs of Ventolin wow. before the next round. We'd do another six minute round. I'd do another five puffs of Ventolin. Wow. I was absolutely overdosing on Ventolin um, because... You had to. I had to, yeah. right? I was using it in completely uh, a completely silly manner. And so I knew that, that as part of lockdown, I needed to sort that out. But a happy byproduct was the moment I stopped eating grains, I didn't realise it, but my asthma started getting better. Mm. So I had a sandwich at this shop, at this, at this garage as I stopped for petrol. And within 20 minutes of me eating this brown bread sandwich... I said, that's funny i'm feeling tight around the chest again i feel like i need a puff of my ventolin and what i've realized is something that you know, i got asthma when i was four years old i was hospitalized a couple of times when i was a kid and i realized that we never got to the bottom of what the trigger was i knew i was allergic to house mite, mice dust mm. uh how house mite dust but there was another trigger that i never realized and it was whatever's in bread there's something in bread that that uh, you know that causes me to get asthma and since mm. i've stopped eating bread my asthma's good i now go training at carlson's and i don't have a ventolin inhaler there wow i've got one at home just in case but you know i'm good so that's another thing that i as i say i made lockdown work for me yeah. i got good at cycling i lost 10 kilos um i stopped taking ventolin inhaler i stopped having asthma i came back to jiu-jitsu um in much better nick than when than when lockdown started mm. and you know hearing you talk about your diet your training the cycling your jiu-jitsu your work everything you have i think one of the not not just one of the most incredible work ethics that i've ever seen but this grit and determination and discipline what does that come from i think that Again, the origin story is that I had Perthes disease when I was four or five years old, and I wasn't allowed to go out and kick a football. Mm. I was kept, I was, I was, I was kept in in the primary school, and basically they gave me books. and, and One of the byproducts of that was, even though I'm not academic and I left school at sixteen, I'm an avid reader. One of the best things that I can do is write. I'm mm. I'm a decent writer, um, and but but one of the bad things was I you know I felt like. I felt like the, not the world was against me, but I felt like I had to fight harder than anyone else. You had else something to prove. I had something to prove from, from Perthes disease as a, as a young man. And then the whole BMX mentality just breeds competitive spirit. And the thing was, you know, and I said this again in the Origins podcast, but let's cover it again because it's, it's really important. I'm lined up with seven other people on a start gate. Mm. The race is 45, 50 seconds long. OK, you're completely allowed to elbow people going into the first corner. And there's none of this. Oh, here's a medal for taking part. And, and all, you know, basically, it's you're going to live and die. And if you don't get in, the, you've driven all the way. Your dad's mm. driven you to Grimsby, right, from 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 London. And if you don't come in the top four in the first three races, you're going home. And they, it's what you call motoed. In other words, you didn't even get into the semi-final. Mm. Like jiu-jitsu in a way, going out in the first round. It's no different. Oh, yeah. Right? And that's why it's so good for kids. Yeah. That's why I'm such a massive fan of jiu-jitsu. Because there is, you know, it's not a medal for taking part. You live and die by that match. You know, are you going to go through? Are you going to win that match? You know, and BMX was the same. And so, I, ha you know, I had that competitive thing drilled into me of, you know, there's seven guys that are going to try and get their way around this BMX track faster than me. And that, again, was, you know, was solidified by what was going on politically in the country at the time with Thatcher, who was saying, you know, that if it, there, will be, there will be a career for you if you work hard. If you don't work hard, there's going to be no benefit system to look after you. We're doing away with the benefit system, so you better get up, up off your ass and, and make something of your life. Now, look, it's not politics that I believe in, mm. but I do also feel it gave me a kick up the ass because I can very much remember at 15 or 16 years old thinking, shit, mm. no, one, no one's going to look after me. I've, you know, I've, got a, I've, got an, I've got to carve out a niche for myself. Yeah, um, And... But again, I think that it's, what is it, nature or nurture? It's a little bit of both. Is it gi yeah. no gi? It's a little bit of both. Well, well that, that, that was going to be sort of my next question, which is this obvious 
discipline and grit that you have in abundance is that something that you can cultivate and cultivate potentially later in life you know it's something a lot of things in in our formative years when you're sort of as a child or as a teenager can really have a massive impact on your entire personality but come someone in their 20s 30s 40s is there anything that they can do perhaps they feel like they don't have the discipline they don't have that 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 sixth gear to go into when they need to is there anything that they can do to get there yeah set goals Mm. goal set and you know and if you read anything by Goggins people like that they'll they'll all say the same thing they set themselves goals and and you know and, and I'll set myself goals subconsciously without even knowing I'm setting them you know when I go you know I run a lot as well um, which I'm terrible at. I'm a terrible runner, but I force myself to do it because I've got a bulldog that needs exercising. Mm. He's not a normal bulldog. He's a turbocharged bulldog. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you know, and I also know that there is nothing as good for stripping fat as running. Yeah. You know, it's, it, beats, it beats cycling for stripping fat. So I run a lot and, and I find myself, even when I'm out running, there's a goal, right? That lamppost there, I'm just going to go as fast as I can to that, that lamppost there. And I do the same thing, not just athletically, but everything in my life. Mm. I, and when I talk about going out on the bicycle and thinking about life as if it's a game of chess, that's what I'm doing. I'm goal setting and and basically putting myself into scenarios and thinking, right, well, if that happens, how will I react? How will I deal with that? So that when I'm hit with something, it doesn't come as a surprise. I've already visualized it and I've already got a plan. Mm. And I've always done that. And I think anyone can do that. And with nature and nurture, do you know, again, as I've got older, I've learned, I've, you know, I've opened my mind. Because if you'd have said to me about jujitsu, I used to think that, you could tell when someone walked in a jiu-jitsu academy whether they had the minerals or not, whether you were going to see them in a year's time or whether actually it was a waste of time and in three months or six months or nine months' time they were going to quit, Yeah. right? And I was, and I strongly believed that. It was only really when me and Dickie turned Carlson's into a full-time academy rather than a kind of hobbyist's club um, and Dickie left work in the city and started teaching full-time that we noticed something and that was that that what I've just said is a load of bullshit okay mm. there are some people who walk into the jiu-jitsu academy and you are and they're the least athletic they don't look like they've got any attributes that are going to help them in jiu-jitsu and you actually think oh, I feel a bit bad about this that guy's going to get hurt right 15 months time or 18 months time they're the best out of that crop of new of new uh, members. You can't judge a book by its cover, and I think that you and I think that these things can be developed. And one of the things things that's great about jujitsu is, and this is another thing I talk to my beginners about, is that jujitsu is what you want it to be, and it, it's not just about your physical attributes; it's also about your mental attributes. There are some yeah. pe- there are some people that regardless of whether they've got long legs and they're good at triangles or whether they're short and squat and they're good at passing the guard, Mm. there are some people that are going to rush into things like a bull in a china shop and just smash and make things work for themselves. And there are other people that are going to analyse uh, analyze a position. They're going to be a lot more careful about how they, how the encounter goes and they're going to be really analytical about their own performance. And life is exactly the same. Um, and I think that everyone will, everyone finds their way as long as they have goals. Mm. So in answer to your question, yeah. it's all about goal setting. I think that when, when human beings start failing is when there is a lack of goal setting. Now that can happen for a number of reasons. It can happen through depression. It can happen because basically giving up, yeah, giving up and finding yourself unable to kind of drag yourself out of whatever quagmire it is you're in, whether it's a relationship quagmire, whether it's a, uh, uh, a professional quagmire at work, whatever it is, you know, just kind of accepting mediocrity Mm. and going, there's nothing I can do about this. There is, you know, Lots of different self-help books can, you know, things like the the five things that you least want to do today 
are the first five things you should do when you wake up in the morning. Yeah. You know, and that, that again comes under goal setting, doesn't it? What don't you want to do? What have you been putting off? Right, write them down. First thing tomorrow morning, get out of bed and get them done. And guess what? Once you've done those five things, you're going to sound, you're going to feel great. You're going to feel absolutely like you've achieved something. Mm. Suddenly your mood is lifted. Suddenly you've got more confidence in yourself. And those things that you were putting off aren't dragging you down subconsciously. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think you're spot on there. I think uh, having something to, having something to always be going for. It's all about momentum, isn't it? And, mm. and and also as well, a goal doesn't, you have big goals, you have small goals, you have goals for the day, you might have goals for the hour. And yeah. then as soon as you start ticking those off, you start to build up that momentum. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you mentioned earlier the UK BJJ, and I think it was in relation to um, COVID and stuff like that. Uh, but I know that you wanted to chat about that. Are you still, you, you still involved with the UK BJJ? I am. I'm, yeah. I'm, in, I'm involved quietly. Me and Dickie have kind of taken a little step back we're both still on the board but we're you know there there is a a new ceo who's doing a fantastic job thank you neil williams yeah, and, he is, yeah. and, and you know and lo lo lots of other people on the board doing a great job but what i wanted to say you know and i don't want to go on and on about this but particularly over covid when everyone was down in the dumps there was a lot of internet negativity about the association yeah and what i wanted to say was was that guys we got through this through COVID, we potentially accelerated getting the UK BJJA um, recognised by, well, it is by recognized the sport. It's, now. It is recognised. Yeah. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is recognised by the UK Sports Council, yeah, which, which is, is a, massive. Huge. That is that is what the, our goal yeah. always was. And the reason being is because when you're recognised as a legitimate sport, suddenly you can go and teach in schools. Suddenly, you can teach in universities, colleges. Suddenly, you can get funds. You can get mm. lottery funds that are allocated to help kids from deprived areas. Mm. Suddenly, the, everything opens up for you. And that's what happened, um, you know, right at the end of COVID. Dickie Martin managed to get what he basically was a five or six year uh, project for him, which is to get us recognized. Mm. And part of part of what went on with covid with the elite training which i know that there was lots of people saying well what do they think so and so is not elite okay what we did was we followed the we followed the the accepted guidelines and we got people into the gyms and what that did was it gave us a seat around the table yeah. and it, and enabled us to talk with the people that up until that point hadn't really had time to talk to us there was massive hurdles with the sports council i don't know what they were all i will say to you is this that you know judo is sports council recognized so is so is wrestling you know we all know that those two sports are going to kind of be suspiciously look at brazilian jiu-jitsu because Threatened. because we're growing so fast yeah okay and of course you know if you're having trouble filling a dojo in another grappling art you're going to look suspiciously at brazilian jiu-jitsu but but anyway you know i'm going off on a tangent now what, what i would say is this we we did what we set out to do and the other thing is there was for years and years, there has been this suspicion that it's all been about a money grab and the mm. money grab's coming sooner or later. With, with the UK BJJA? With the UK BJJA. Guys, you know, we've been around, you know, Dave Coles, myself and Dickie put this together. How long ago now, Dan? I mean, it's years and years Yeah, it's, it's been I mean, a while, yeah. I mean, 2014 or 20, 2013, something yeah. like that, right? There hasn't been a money grab, right? That, mm. that suspicion, that kind of, uh, you know that thought process of sooner or later they're going to hit us with it mm. it's never come and it's not going to come okay the whole thing about the uk bjja was that if we create a brazilian jiu-jitsu association and we love brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah. what is going to stop it's going to stop someone a businessman yeah. coming in and Doing starting same, an yeah. association who who doesn't love Brazilian jiu-jitsu and does see it as a money grab. If we can establish ourselves first and write it in the tenets of the association mm. that it doesn't matter who takes over, they're not able to change that association. It is what it is. It's part of the, the agreement of what the association is. Mm. And the whole idea was, was to basically create an association which supported from the ground up UK Brazilian jiu-jitsu and to stop anyone from profiting as an association, to make it a non-profit.
non-profit association, which is what it's always been. I think it's still 15 quid. It might be 20 quid now. I'm not sure. But it's very, very reasonable. You look at the price compared to judo, wrestling, you know, karate, whatever, you know. And I think that we've succeeded. And I think that also the other thing is, it was really, really difficult for Brazilian jiu-jitsu COVID. And I know that the elite scheme didn't benefit absolutely everyone. And so there was a lot of people going, well, hang on a second, how come they can do that? But what we did do, we managed to make sure that our IBJJF uh, medal winning athletes were able to train in their academies. Yeah. We also made sure that academies, you know, if they got a knock on the door and they were running an elite program. They had th- some some paper uh, that points. Exactly. Yeah. They weren't going to get, you know, fine. They were legitimately doing something you know we i feel that we i'm not saying we kept brazilian jiu-jitsu alive because that would be overstating the fact but i think that we did the right thing in very very difficult circumstances for Mm. the sport and i think that it benefited far more people than than, yeah than than it than it had a negative effect on yeah you know um yeah, I mean the, the UK BGA is an interesting one because you know I, I'm part of the board. I'm part of the board now, and um, since since I was a was appointed onto the board, and I've been able to see what is actually going on there. I mean, I was someone. I'm 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 an open minded person, and I saw the the UK BGA. You know, my tournament was was a part of the uh, you know one of the ranked events at one point. I've been a member and all of that stuff, and and you know, I looked upon and go, I'm, I'm not sure if you know, I'm I'm skeptical about this or that. Since I've joined the board, I think, uh, and I've joined the board sort of to help with the um, you know my role is kind of in promotional and, and PR and stuff like that. I do think that the UK BGA has not done the best job of representing themselves and what they actually do. What people need to understand is there are a lot of people for no money whatsoever working their asses off mm. for the UK BGJA. Like they really are. Like yeah. it's unbelievable. You that you look at the the the, the app that we use to um you know for, for people that talk about whatever project projects are going on and the work that's being done. There is an enormous amount of work that is going on behind the scenes for zero gain other than people volunteering their time love of jiu-jitsu. for the love of jiu-jitsu so it really changed my opinion on on the obviously everything changed when we got sport england recognition because that like you said that's the goal it goes from being uh, uh you know because there's been a few associations tried to set up um but but now this is the association this is the one that's going to get us to where we need to go be it funding which they are getting now be it taking it further than that and even you know trying to get it even more recognized within the country and even internationally uh so so it's a super important organization but i think um hopefully i can help i might even get neil or someone on to, to talk about the you you know what the uk bgj are doing in more detail on, on on a podcast one day but there is a huge amount of work that's going on behind the scenes very very positive work and these people are putting in hours and hours of their time every day sometimes uh completely for free to try and help the sport Hmm. And, and you know, and, and at the end of the day, I think that we've been around long enough now that <clears throat> anyone who's still suspicious is just a conspiracy theorist. Because yeah. it, if it was going to happen, if suddenly we were going to say, "Hey, here's a syllabus. You can't get your blue belt via a UK BJJA grading yeah. until you can do three different escapes from Mount and all of that rubbish." Which, by the way, I would completely disagree with. You know, yeah. because Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is infinite and. Brazilian jiu-jitsu should be taught to suit the body type. The, 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 you know, I don't want anyone tied to a syllabus. Mm. Um, you know, if they are tied to a syllabus, it should be the instructor's syllabus, yeah. not, not something handed by an association. One of the things that I least like about my judo black belt is that it came from the Brazilian, from, the that it came from the, from the British Judo Association yeah. rather than, you know, Ray Stevens or Peter Blewett, who were my teachers, right? You know, that's something that that I think is awful. I love the fact that Brazilian jiu-jitsu belts are handed down from instructor to student, um, and it has nothing to do with an association. I think that's fantastic. You know, there there isn't a money grab. Yeah, and I'm I'm confident in the team that we have now, um, especially with Neil leading it, that it's in very, very safe hands for, for the time being anyway. Should we talk about Tom Hardy? 
I was just going to say, we talk about work. Uh, how's work been since, I, I mean, just very briefly, kind of completely un jiu related at all. Yeah. Uh, how was the movie industry uh, um, through COVID and post-COVID? I know that it's still, there's still tests required and stuff like that and masks on set. Yeah. 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 Because um, you know, it was, it, obviously the movie, it's, movie it, industry was crippled by just it like was. everyone else. You know, we, we couldn't go to work. Yeah. Like, you know. Which actually for me was a positive thing because it, it created a great big reset. Yeah. I didn't know it at the time. I was furious. Yeah, sure. But actually, retrospectively looking back, I made it work for me and I made, you know, it was a re... And I know everyone says, oh, it's a reset. But I, I'm so busy and so driven that I hadn't taken a breath yeah. throughout my whole life. And it actually gave me a chance to take a breath and be introspective and to to make some really positive changes in my life, which I've already spoken about. But how is the movie industry? We're back now. Um, we've been back for a long time. We've been back for over. You know, we we came back the moment lockdown. The moment lockdown finished, yeah. we were back making films. But basically, you have to wear a mask on set Still? at all times. Still, wow. Still. And you have to be tested three times a week still. Because, I mean, one outbreak will shut down production, which will cost millions sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 you know, essentially a big movie, like the movies that I'm fortunate enough to work on now, are probably costing between 150000 and $250,000 per, wow. per day. Depending on how big the day is. Yeah. Depending on whether it's a stunt sequence with a helicopter or whether it's a, you know shooting interior in a, in a sound studio. Yeah. But between $150,000 and $250,000 a day. And so, you know, it would be, you know... So, if you had to shut down a production because you weren't COVID testing, because your leading lady or your leading man got COVID or whatever, and someone had made that call not to test for COVID, their head would be on the chopping block. Yep. And so it's like anything in business, you know, asses must be covered. We must do the right thing. We must make sure that everyone's as safe as possible because people are there for work. If you go into a jiu-jitsu academy, right, and you're not wearing a mask, mm. That's your decision. Yeah. It's cool. That's your personal decision. When people go to work, it's not a personal decision. They mm. have to go to work. And so you really have to make things as safe as possible for them. Um, you know, I'm not a, a fan of wearing a mask. I'm not a fan of three times a week testing. But I recognize that it's part of my responsibility in the job that I do, what I'm being hired to do. And I'm completely 100% supportive of that. Mm. Do I want it to finish? Yes, as soon as possible. Am I ever going to moan about it to anyone on a film set? No, I'm not. Because you just have to get on with it. And you have to, you know, you have to do what's what's best for the production. Yeah. Um, and that leads us on to Tom because I wanted to talk about Tom. I wanted to talk about um, about what a positive thing it's been for the for the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu community worldwide, yeah, especially UK Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. But I also wanted to talk about trolls, okay, right? And what I would say, is, and and you know, and it leads quite nicely on from this whole thing about how much it costs to run a film shoot. Sure, and. Those films that Tom's doing yeah. are $150,000 per day or oh, yeah. $250,000. I mean, one of the biggest day. stars in the world, right? Exactly. And so one thing that I learned very early on from doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with people that are actors specifically is that they are in a really, really difficult position because you know as well as I do that sometimes in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you're either going to get a mat burn across your cheek or you're going to get a nose like mine. Okay, that can happen. Or you're going to get your tooth knocked out. Or you're going to get a cauliflower ear. Usually at the or, worst possible time, or, you know. Or, or, you know, you're going to have a clash of heads. Yeah. Right? And you're going to have a cut down there, which just won't stop bleeding. And so one of the things that I learned very, very early on, and one of the reasons which stopped Jason Statham being able to train as much as he wanted to with me and Guy, was the responsibility that actors have that... Th once they're on a project, they can't roll full power with people. They sure. can't go to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because I was going to say an idiot might injure them, but it might not be an idiot. Yeah. It and might just be just a happen. legit yeah, yeah. clash of heads. Yep. You know, you know, a snap down off a Muay Thai clinch, you know, whatever it is, right? These things happen and, and actors, unless they are 
unless they have been told to train by production, for instance, Keanu for John Wick or whatever, yeah. and you're training for a specific fight scene with stuntmen, then you are going to be in an awful lot of trouble. It doesn't matter what, how big a star you are. If production has to stop shooting while you heal up this big cut that you've got down your forehead, mm. you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Mm. And by the way, guess what? The sound man that was rolling with you is going to be in even more trouble. <laughs> so that's one of have the Have you ever been in trouble for that reason is the first question I have to ask. I remember when... Um, I haven't been in trouble for... But I, I do remember on Snatch, or it might have even been Lockstock, I can't remember what film... But we were kind of talking about um, about rolling and this and that and you know and I was talking and I was talking about I'd rolled with Statham the previous night <laughs> and the producer who by the way was very kind to me about it and you've got to bear in mind this is a low budget movie yeah had it been a Hollywood movie this later on in my career yeah he wouldn't have been so nice because <laughs> it was a different level sure but the producer the line producer pulled me aside and said can I can I have a, a word with you Simon so, and I thought oh, what does he want we walked around the corner he said I. You were doing this grappling thing with Jason last night. And I said, yeah. And he said, are you an idiot? <laughs> and, and I literally, I did, and I said, no, why? What, you know, what's wrong, with, what's wrong with that? Thinking to myself, I'll do whatever I want after work. Yeah. And he said, Jason's starring in this movie. If we have to shut down because Jason can't, can't be in the movie, you know, you can't be grappling with him. Yeah. You know. And, it makes and, sense, doesn't and it? It suddenly hit me like a ton of bricks. Yeah. The producer was 100% right. And so what I wanted to say about Tom was, there's been a few trolls on the internet that talk about, oh yeah, well, hang on a second. He started training for this film this many years ago. He's only a blue belt. All I would say is this, Tom is busy. He's a busy actor. And actors aren't able to roll mm. the way that you are if you're a computer analyst. Yeah. And you can get on the tube every night and go to... Roger Gracie Academy or Carlson Gracie Academy or wherever it is. You know, as an actor, you can't do it because even mm. if you keep it secret, so, you know, someone, someone will have it on the phone yeah. or whatever. And so these actors actually have a really tough time with their training because they have, sure, they have times where they can train like a full-time athlete in between films and they can go to the gym three times a day and they can do privates with a really great black belt. Mm. But there are other times where... There's nine months where they got to themselves to a really nice level, and there's then there's nine months where they can't no training train. at all. There's no training at all. So is that what you think Tom's doing? Is Tom is training and doing these competitions when he's not on a film? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And 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 you know, and the other thing that I wanted to say was I saw a Facebook comment, and in fact, someone someone was talking to me. And, uh, and and this is something I really wanted. And this isn't the jiu-jitsu community. This is more the kind of the wider community mm -hmm. who, you know, there's a picture of Tom winning a gold medal or whatever. And you mm. see, some, you know, you scroll down, you think that's great. It's great for jiu-jitsu. And you scroll down and someone says, yeah, I bet they let him win, right? And it's like, guys, have you got no idea? Well, you know, yeah. Right? Because here's the thing. And this is what I said. Someone said this verbally to me, someone that doesn't do jiu-jitsu, someone that I know said, yeah, but I bet that I read somewhere that they, that they let him win. And it's like, dude, let me just stop you right there. Okay. The first thing is this. All right. If you were fighting Bane in a jujitsu <laughs> competition, would you let him win? Or would you go no, you want to be all the first out of course to win you would. that match so you can say, I tapped Bane? Of course you would. And also, right? he I think he's won every tournament that he's entered so exactly. far. Exactly. He's undefeated. Exactly. <laughs> and what I I'm, look, I'm, I'm considering entering, uh, you know, light, heavy, blue belt, Masters Tour, <laughs> whatever. I want to I wanna take him on. Because here's the thing, right? <laughs> you think about it. Think about how many movie stars have done Brazilian jiu-jitsu over the years. And respect to them. A lot. But how many of them have competed? It's basically zero. Because, I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't here's do any the deal. others. Here's the deal. Why? Ego. Because they're... No. No? It's not even that. Skill? No. Go on. They're on a lose-lose. Sure. You can't win. Yeah. Because if you win, someone on Facebook says, yeah, but I bet they let him win. Sure. And if you lose, they say, ha, 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 Bane yeah. got tapped. Yeah. Right? And so what I wanted to say publicly about Tom Hardy is massive, massive pair of kahunas yeah, 100%, swinging. 100%. Swinging. Those are big balls. Yeah. Because he's done what no one else could do, yeah. which is he went, do you know what? I'm going to go and give it a go. 
and screw it. If I lose, I lose. You know, that takes a mat. And yeah, ego, you're right. It's ego. Lack of ego. That's what I'm saying. Lack yeah. of ego, Dan. Yeah. And, and you know, and I just wanted to say that, you know, that I've got so much respect for that dude for going and, and, and doing that. Not just one. And by the way, she's done it once and got a gold medal. Yeah. So he got all of the good press yeah. that you could get. Everyone's saying, well, yeah, we knew he was tough and, yeah, he's the real deal. He got... He, he didn't to need do to go it, and yeah. do it a second time. He was done. Yeah. If it was only a PR exercise, he got his gold. Yeah. Three weeks later, if he'd have gone and got beaten, then that PR wouldn't have been so valuable, mm. right? He went and did it. I've just got so much respect for him for, for doing it. I mean, not just for, for what it's done for our sport, but just as an individual, as a yeah. dude, yeah. right? Just as a, as a, as a geezer, yeah. right? He really, really has gone and done something very, very selfless and big balls. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you anymore. I think, one, he may, maybe got more eyes on our sport than any other event in history. It's like it's crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, after he won that last tournament in, in Milton Keynes a couple of weeks ago, it was on the, you know, it was in the Times. It was in, it was in the Independent. It was... It was all over non jujitsu or non martial art related news sites, um, and and it's doing fantastic stuff for our sport. Uh, there are going to be a lot of people who start jujitsu because of him. Yeah, it's, it's massive. Yeah. And talking about the competition, I think you're spot on with that. I've got a huge amount of respect for him because um, a, a, a blue belt, a hobbyist blue belt, competing in the masters two division has absolutely nothing to lose, mm. unless you're an A list celebrity. Absolutely. Who has everything to lose because especially if you're an A-list celebrity who kind of is known for being a tough one guy. of the chaps, a tough guy. Yeah. Bane. And and, and I imagine yeah. Tom will probably be the first person to tell you that he's not a tough guy. He just plays him in the movies, right? Uh I mean look look, to qualify this, I know Tom very well. Yeah. We grew up in the same neighborhood. Yeah. We did lay a cake together, you know, before he became a Hollywood superstar. So, yeah. you know, one of the reasons I'm sticking up for him is because he's my mate. Yeah. But he doesn't train at Carlson's. Yeah. Um, you know, it drove me mad seeing the trolling and I just wanted to put it straight and just say, I, I, on, you know, what, you know, he was on a lose-lose. Yeah. And I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen a huge amount of that. Um, I try not to pay Look, I, you will always have trolls. Yeah. You will always have trolls. Don't worry about them, Simon. <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you a little, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a little lesson, Simon. Yeah. Don't worry about the fucking trolls, okay? Because the way that I look at it with trolls, and people have asked me about this before, I've had trolls for the last 10 years that I've been competing, and I love it because yeah. I it, it, it really it really means nothing to me. Yeah. Um, I just see it as funny. I think you don't, you haven't made it until you've got haters. And I think uh, a lot of, the way that I look at it with, with, with anyone who spouts negativity online is a reflection of their own insecurities and their yeah. own issues really no yeah, one right. no there's no happy person mm. who logs on to something and says something shitty to someone that they don't know yeah. no nobody there is no but, happy person who does that um and i think it's the same for tom which is not you know anyone who you you, you are casting um no one's character is exposed in that exchange apart from yeah. the person that's spouting the negativity but you know what What I would say is well done to the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community because none of those trolls that I'm mentioning yeah. were part of our community. Yeah. The thing about our community is it's self-policing and we, we know that when you go to a competition, no one's ever going to let you win, no. right? It, that just isn't happening regardless, yeah. right? The second thing is we all know that just going to a competition, whether you're a white belt, blue belt, whatever belt you are, okay, is a massive... Every time you walk through the doors to a competition and you've registered, you know that there's 25 people in your weight division who are sitting at home that didn't want to register. Yeah. So you've already won. You, you know, you've already won even if you lose. You yeah. know, and the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community knows that. We all know that competing is tough. And it I like the fact that everyone was, you know, we, there wasn't any trolling in our community. Yeah. And, and, and uh, it doesn't even surprise me because he is doing so good. It is so cool to see. And there, there's a massive difference between celebrities training and then celeb and, and like you said, we, we, we've had tra training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is sort of the, the fad 
celeb thing to do at the moment everyone's training it's so good for the sport it really is um and some of them are training uh doing just privates and not really get, actually having the true jiu-jitsu experience um i know i think it was higgin machado who was really at the forefront of the celebrity training movement and yeah. he kind of had a separate he was program training ashton kushta ashton, uh, demi yeah. lovato yes. you know a, a lot of big names yeah. and they were sort of on a separate sort of almost syllabus where there wasn't a lot of sparring and all of this stuff and then you've got guys who are really throwing it down you know russell brand in the uk he's yeah, actually by the, the way, respect to russell 100 well, i haven't trained with russell but um i'd love to train with him i'm a big fan of him me, me, cool me too thing. as well and um you know, he, he's trained. And then you have the next level. Tom, Tom has, Tom, ju, Tom's jiu-jitsu journey is just a regular guy who's just doing jiu-jitsu. Yeah. And he just happens to be a massive Hollywood celebrity. Yeah. He's training. He's going to competition. He's not making a big song and dance about it. He's just going there. He's chucking the gear on. He's signing up with everyone else. And he's got a huge amount of, imagine being in that division and, 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 just because he's Bane and Charles Bronson and all of the other stuff, it doesn't make him any better at jiu-jitsu. So he's got to go down there. He's got to throw down. All eyes are on him and he's killing it. So, uh, By the way, you, you've got all the same Facebook friends as me, right? Yeah. Right. In other words, the whole of the UK Brazilian jiu-jitsu community. <laughs> yeah, basically. How many people did you see on Facebook with, that, with, with Tom with, that, with his arm around them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Know, oh, yeah. Um, right? I mean, he must have been absolutely swarmed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Every single picture. Big yeah. smile. Yeah. Time for people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, Tom, if you're listening, if by any chance. No, I'd love to get him on the podcast. Uh, I know that Tom, I'd, I'd love to get him on the podcast period to talk about his jiu-jitsu journey. Talk about what it's like to compete and, 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 and the popularity that he's brought. And then, of course, I know that he's, uh, he's really massively into reorg mm. um yeah, he's doing a lot of work with he's doing guys. a lot I, I mean respect. You, you know respect. that that kind of see, seems to be his passion at the moment yeah. is helping people um especially in emergency services and and, and, and military veterans through jiu-jitsu so yeah if anyone knows tom uh, and he wants to come on the uk's best jiu-jitsu podcast to talk about jiu-jitsu and reorg then uh slide into my dms but yeah so uh big up to tom and uh and and, and all the celebrities that are trained jiu-jitsu because yeah. it's really it is good for the sport yeah uh, anyway, what do we have next? We've got this long list of things to talk about. We spoke about your diet. We spoke about cycling. I was worried that we weren't going to have enough to talk about. Bro, we've got so much to talk about. <laughs> it's not even... We, we, got, we could talk for days, Simon, for days. Um, yeah, let's talk about... I mean, we, we already mentioned it earlier, but it's definitely a... Oh, we need to talk about a workout earlier as well. Uh, Should what, we do that now? Let's do that now. Okay. Because otherwise... <laughs> Yeah, let's not run out of time on so that. So you, uh, we, we agreed to do this podcast and you said, Dan, come come do a workout with me. Um, one of the most interesting <laughs> workouts I've ever done, um, including the warm-up, it was less than 40 minutes. I mean, the fastest workout I've ever done in my life. Two of us training, 40 Whole minutes. Body. Full body, push, pull, legs, everything. Exhausted afterwards, limp into the car. Um, and we did like, what was it? Eight sets or something. So it's called med, medex. The, the, the type of equipment that we use was called medex. So, so talk me through, like kind of explain what we were doing and explain the history and, and then sort of the theory and everything behind it. Okay. So the, the first thing that I'd say is, is that we were going to get straight into this from the get go, but I wanted to talk about jujitsu first, because obviously this is primarily a jujitsu podcast and I didn't want people that weren't interested in weight training, just kind of tuning out. Um, if you've got this far, you're probably into weight training. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I've also obviously, Dan, I've watched you grow literally, yep. right? Um, you know, when I met you, you were 14 years old yeah, uh, and, and you probably weighed about 64, Oh, less than that. When yeah. I, my first competition, uh, I think I fought at uh, fifty-five kilos. Yeah. yeah. So I've I've seen you grow into someone that loves uh, resistance training. Yeah. Particularly strongman stuff, and I know that you're very open-minded because you're not doing a standard powerlifting or a bodybuilding system. You've kind of found your own niche, and I wanted to just because I know you're open-minded. I wanted to show yeah. you something that I play yeah. with a lot, um, and about. 15 no about 10 years ago the gym that i train in in putney which is called physical culture uh oh, what a gym that is by the way it's an amazing do a shout it's out a, like physical culture in putney if you're anywhere in south or southwest london 
um, you, you should go and train there if you're into training because it's not just about the medics equipment. It's also about the strongman equipment. It's also about the chains, the powerlifting equipment. I, I mean, for it's me, really well for me per- personally, like I went there, I bought some stuff off of him uh, uh, last year, I think, or earlier this year. And I went in there and it was like walking into paradise. Yeah. I mean, everywhere you look, r- very rare. And for me, who's a bit of a nerd with the strength equipment uh, and, and, and other stuff like that, I'm just looking left and right and like, oh my God, this, this from here and this from here. Uh, one of the most unique um, and, 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 and cool gyms that I've seen. I started training there in 1993. The short version of this to get us into the super slow training that we're going to talk about is that Chris Quinn, the owner, and he was a bodybuilder and he ended up like all bodybuilders because you put so much, uh, you put your body through so much, yeah. he ended up pretty injured. And he wanted to carry on training and he found a system where you could train hard but not put your body through so much negative uh, energy. And what I mean by that is this. This thought process is something that Arthur Jones, who designed Nautilus equipment back in the 1970s, uh, discovered. And his protege was Mike Mensah, who was a championship winning bodybuilder. Dorian Yates, who you will know, who won Mr. Olympia, kind of has taken a lot of their ideas and abbreviated it into Dorian's own system. Mm. But Dorian's system is similar in lots of ways. And I'm not saying it's exactly the same. But the Arthur Jones system basically is what we call HIT, high intensity training, super slow. And what you do is you do it on machines. And the reason why you do it on machines is because whenever you're training, and I'm not saying that it's the only way, I still train with free weights. I still recommend that people train with, with, lot, with an open mind, with lots of different systems. But this system, what it does is it majors on the fact that whenever you fail on a free weight, it's because you've hit a sticking point. Mm. And what that sticking point is, for example, On a bench press, it's always going to be when you're within an inch of pushing the bar off your chest because that's where you're at your weakest because your triceps haven't engaged. Mm. As your arms straighten, you get more tricep fiber engaging into the exercise. Yeah, hence like a lockout, you know, or... uh, So when you fail, it will generally be just as you're pushing it off your chest when Mm. you're at your weakest. Um, With a squat, when you fail it will be right at the deepest point, okay, before you've engaged all of your muscle fibers. So what Arthur Jones did with these bits of equipment was he basically did what we call cam them. In other words, the way that the pulleys on them work is a kidney shape rather than a circle is the best way of describing it. Mm. And they are cammed so that when your body is at its weakest, the machine makes the weight slightly lighter for you. When your body is at its strongest, the machine is making the weight heavier for you. So, for instance, you will never fail on a sticking point, which means that when you fail on a sticking point, it's not true failure. Mm. You could have gone deeper into failure, which is what you found today, Mm. right? You know, you found where failure really is today. And it's horrible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what happens is, for instance, let's just talk about bench press because it's something everyone understands. On a chest press, right, the, the medics chest press, when you're here and you're pushing out right from where you're, from, from when the handles are next to your chest, right, the machine is making it slightly easier. As your arms extend and your tricep fibers come to help your chest, the machine makes it heavier. Mm. So the whole idea is, is that you're going to go deep, deep into failure. You're not going to fail on a sticking point. The next idea is this, is that you are, you only need to fail once. And that growth and strength increases come from failure. Is there anything to be gained from failing twice or three times why do we do three sets mm. who who says we should do three sets and where's the science where's the science behind that yeah and if three sets is better than one set is six sets better than three sets mm. and if six sets are better than three sets then nine sets, exactly where, do, where does it all end yeah well it ends like this the guy that hammers in uh nails all day the chippy he hasn't got 22 inch biceps has he I don't know. Maybe right. maybe they're pretty big. I don't know. Right. Generally, the chippies. No, they're wiry. Right? Okay. Okay. Right. I can I tell know, you. Blacksmith, I work with Bla- Blacksmiths have big arms. Right. 
So that's from holding the horses. <laughs> but here's but here's the thing, yeah. right? There, there, you know, the whole point is is that you get your most bang for the buck from failing mm. once, and that any further failures, all it's going to do is detract from your next set on a different exercise or detract from the sport you're going to do if you're a jiu-jitsu sure, guy, yeah. right? So why ruin yourself going to failure three times and then you're knackered for jiu-jitsu when you could get the same amount of a strength increase from just failing once if you go into deep failure? And the next thought process about it, Dan, is this, that when we're at our weakest point on an exercise, let's talk about bench press, we tend to lower the 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 bar and bounce it off our chest. We go, bam yeah. And what we're basically doing is we're using our ligaments and our tendon, tendons like elastic bands. And, we, and to get ourselves past that very weak point, that sticking point, we're almost loading up our tendons and using momentum to help us get through that weak point right the whole point is with super slow is that you don't use your tendons and your ligaments at all you stop at the bottom of the exercise when when the bar is next to your chest you stop for a half a second and then you push off with linear strength so in other words rather than using your tendons and ligaments you're only using your muscles and what that does is if you think about every injury you've ever had from lifting weights, mm. it will always, well, 90% of the time, it will you, the injury will occur between either the positive and negative motion or the negative and positive motion because that's where you have a change of force. Yeah. It's, you know, that's where you have that massive change from lowering the weight to lifting the weight or pulling the weight to letting the weight go back up. And if you actually take that change of force, slow it down, stop for a second before you change the direction that you're moving in, you're far, far less likely to injure yourself. So that's basically what the super slow system is. It's one set per exercise to deep, deep failure. Mm. You're not counting reps. You're trying to fail somewhere between one minute and one minute 30 seconds. If you get to one minute 30 seconds... You're not lifting heavy enough, yeah. right? If you can't lift for a minute, you're lifting too you're, you're lifting too heavy, right? You're on the same weight for a couple of months, okay? You're getting one minute ten, one minute fifteen, one minute twenty-two. The moment you get one minute thirty-two seconds, using the same uh, the the same cadence every time, mm -hmm. so that you know that nothing has changed. The weight is the same. The cadence is the same. Well, suddenly you can do it for one hundred and thirty two for for one minute thirty two seconds mm. rather than one minute twenty seconds. You're twelve seconds better. You're stronger. Next week you come in and you put the weight up. Yeah. And so that's basically how it works. Tell us what you think about the training. I mean, it was it it, it was crazy to be honest with you. I, I mean, I've I've done tempo work before. I I I haven't done a huge amount of. Um, basically, I've never trained with machines properly. Uh, I'll if I'm traveling and I go visit a gym because there's no machines in my gym. Um, if I'm traveling and I go visit a gym for a little pump up, I'll jump on a machine and they're good fun. You do some rows, you do some pull downs, you do some pressing. You know, you get a good pump up. Uh, you you can kind of you can work. They're easier than three weeks because you're you're focusing on the muscles, you know, kind yeah. of what you said. Uh, but but actually doing a proper workout on them, I haven't done before. Then uh, with the tempo as well, I certainly haven't done. And then this madness of one set. And when people hear one set, this isn't one working set. It's one set. I mean, we did a very brief w warm up, and then we did. I mean, what what exercise was it? It was a um, chest press. Chest press. Shoulder press, uh, pull down, row, uh, delt raise, uh, and then three leg exercises, a hamstring curl, uh, quad extension, leg press. It's eight exercises. We did eight sets. We did eight sets. The, the entire workout was eight sets, which is completely fucking ludicrous, For right? The whole body. The whole body. Eight sets. Not eight exercises, eight sets. And how did you feel at the oh, end? Oh, absolutely exhausted. Because you are going to failure... Um, at one and, and, and to qualify this, if you haven't done this workout, and you think, yeah, but failure, I always got failure. This no, no, failure no. is true, different. true, true, and, true failure. And you're right. You know, there's something about these machines. They do work in an interesting way. Could you do this with other machines, or does it have no, to be? No, it's not worth trying. Um, I don't think. Yeah, because, like you said, you're you're 
you know, the whole goal, the aim was to get to a sticking point kind of in the middle of the movement, not at the bottom of the movement, but a sticking point in the middle of the movement and then spend two or three seconds continuing to try and push through until you yeah. absolutely can't do it and then you're done for the set. And because you're going to that failure, it does feel like the, the, the machine wants you the you can almost feel the machine urging you to do another rep yeah. because it because, because it's it, cammed and it's working the way your body it feels works. lighter in that yeah. start position and you know I'm, I'm i was jumping in with your weights and obviously you, you've been doing this for for a while your weights are obscene I, I mean half the machines we're maxing out and these aren't you know these machines going up to like 200 kilos or something so we're doing some obscene weight on these exercises each and every rep is hard and then you're doing it slowly so it's controlled and then you go into failure. I mean, it was... Uh, and it, how did your cardio system feel? Because this is the other thing. Remember yeah. that when you're doing powerlifting or bodybuilding, you're generally, right, you're breathing in when you're not making the effort yeah. and you're breathing out during the effort and it's and it's one breath per rep. Yeah. Talk about how many breaths you were well, doing per rep. Oh, yeah. because Well, because each rep is 10 seconds long, you're breathing the entire way through. Yeah. And you are, you know, because it's a, it's, it's anaerobic, but it's working that, that the, the lungs and the heart's beating to try and get blood into the muscles faster. Um, so you're working extremely slowly with yeah. your muscles, but as you progress through the set, you're getting more and more out of breath. So you literally, <laughs> yeah. until you fail. And, yeah. And, on failure, it feels like you've just run a 400 meter race, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's uh, totally humbling, and uh, and you were killing it, Simon, embarrassing me, totally embarrassing me. Uh, but yeah, it was an interesting workout. It was, it was. Uh, and 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 what I would say is this: it's not that it's the be all and end all. Of course, you're not engaging your stabilizing muscles, which I know is a major part of what you do with free weights and strongman training. Yeah, and that 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 will be your your forte. Your stabilizing muscles will yeah. be incredible if you only do this type of training there are things and you're it's also you're missing explosivity which yeah. you would get from powerlifting movements um but and and so i still use powerlifting movements i still use free weights i don't only use this system i i only use that system for five years yeah and i didn't get any weaker when mm. i went back to normal free weights i was exactly the same strength. and by the way bear in mind that when I went back to say bench press, I had lost the skill of bench pressing, yeah. but I could still lift the weight that I'd stopped on for just as many reps. So, um, so, so how often a week would you do that workout? Right now I'm doing that workout about once every fortnight. Okay. Right. And, and, uh, and is that how it's meant to be used? It's meant to be used as a, no. as like a, 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 once in a week or once every two weeks. Your the whole Arthur Jones philosophy is that it takes the human body seven full days, depending on your genetics, that it takes the human body se seven full days to recover 100% mm. from 100% effort. Mm. Which is one of the reasons why I say to my jiu-jitsu students, if you're training, if you're, if you're doing jiu-jitsu on a Thursday night and you're fighting on a Sunday, you're crazy. Mm. You should, you really, you should be giving yourself a lot and when i say training i mean sparring mm. of course go and drill but even if you're oh no i'm not sparring that hard yeah mate but you're still gripping your forearms are going to blow up it so the whole idea is is that it takes seven days to recover from 100 percent effort yeah and that is 100 percent effort and so uh what what i do with that is i play with it and i use it as part of my program i lift i lift free weights in the gym at carlson's mm. um and i do that you know once a week um and then the other thing that i do which i've always spoken to you about uh when we whenever we've spoken is i do three sets per day in my back garden i've got a bunch of weights i've got a chinning bar a dipping bar and i do three sets per day um whether of, uh, calisthenics either three sets of dips to failure yeah or three sets of chins to failure or three sets of shoulder press with some dumbbells to failure or even three sets of bicep curls. But what I feel is, is that that's enough to keep me strong and muscular without enough for it to be detrimental to my, uh, to, to whatever I'm doing in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or on the bicycle or whatever it is. It doesn't, it keeps me strong, but doesn't knacker me out for mm. other sports. And that's the problem is when you start weight training so hard that it actually starts 
being negative for your other sports because you're turning up at the dojo tired. Yeah. And and that's where the balance towards weight training has swung too far. Mm. Yeah, it, 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 it is all about that. And, you know, a lot of people will just assume that I go crazy and work out every single day. Um, I'll do something every day, but I usually have one or two. I'll have two workouts a week, maybe a third light one, maybe a couple of small movement, you know, days where I do a bit of movement before I do jiu-jitsu uh, or, or apart from my jiu-jitsu session. I mean, yeah, it, it's an interesting workout. I mean, especially because it's unbelievably quick. I mean, like like insanely fast, a 40-minute well, that, that, workout. That's the other real positive. Yeah. So, you, so your time spent in the gym isn't that much. I'd say, I, I think, uh, I, I basically, I, I was away for a week, so I came home on Monday. I worked out Tuesday, worked worked out yesterday, and today's Thursday, and I've worked out today. So I'm sore as hell anyway, because I basically, it is a, I was talking to my friend when I was training on Wednesday. Uh, the, the speed in which your body adapts to exercise is unbelievably quick in that, I'm, uh, I did like a, like a standard, like almost recovery workout. I'll do, I'll do a hundred pull-ups, usually like five sets of 20 or 10 sets of 10. And I will never be sore from that. Mm. One week of no lifting weights and I do a hundred pull-ups and my lats are mm. so sore the next day, literally one week off. But if I do it again on Monday, I do a hundred pull-ups again, it won't feel anything, which it's just unbelievable the way that how fast your body adapts to something and how quickly it can unadapt to something as well. well that's another reason why I'm cha- always changing what I'm doing. Um, and look, I may well be doing the same exercises, but some weeks I'll do three sets of five. In other words, mm. strength training, powerlifting style. Other weeks I'll do a set of 12, a set of 10 and a set of eight. In other words, bodybuilding rep ranges. Yeah. Um, to, so that, the moment my body thinks that it knows what I'm going to do, I hit it with something different because mm. then it has to keep adapting. So it's almost like what my advice would be to people is get a solid year of weight training under your belt with whatever system you're going to use just so that you build an understanding of the movements and you're using correct form. But then start being more instinctive and start shocking your body mm. and 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 never hitting your body with the with with the same workout twice and you know as i say it doesn't have to be different exercises it's the way that you do exercises yeah um you know one of the things that i like we've got a rope at carson's one of the things that i like to do every couple of weeks is when my body thinks that it's going to do a set of wide grip chin-ups no we're going to tra- train we're going to climb the rope without using our legs mm. all the way to the ceiling and you know the day after my lats are just torn yeah. to shreds yeah you know yeah. Which is, by the way, rope climbing is oh fantastic, so, so good best. for jujitsu. One hundred percent. And 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 we stole that. The reason why Dicky put that that's rope, from judo. We we stole it from judo. Yeah. When I was training at the Budokai, at the end of the 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 black belt training session, which generally had team team GB athletes in it every week. Yeah. Um, Ray Stevens would get the rope down, and there'd be a little competition about who could go up the rope and back down and back up without yeah. using their legs. With your with your legs out horizontally in front of you, so you're training your whole core mm. section, your abs, and you go chunk, chunk, chunk with your hands, mm. um, and and you know, and that is how the judo guys trained, yeah. And so we stole that off them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, the rope, rope ropes are brilliant. Yeah, um, you kind of moving on to on from that, but still connected is sort of the, you know, you've mentioned fifty three years old. Yeah. So you were in your late forties when we last spoke. In your early fifties now, and. You, you know you're, you're you're in great shape. You're physically capable to train. Uh, Hang with, on a second, with Dan. Dan, yeah. Dan, I've got to stop you here. Yeah, I've just done the maths. Yeah, and it just goes to show what an idiot I am. Go on, I'm 52. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank guys, I just stole a year. <laughs> I was just thinking 53. 50, yeah. Doesn't sound right. You lose track after a while, don't you? Well, there you go. I'm prone to exaggeration. So I'm fifty. I'm fifty-two. Thank goodness. But yeah, I'm fifty-two. Anyway, yeah. go on. It doesn't make too much of a uh, of a difference. I'm sure lots of people will be listening to this by the time you turn fifty-three. Um, so you're fifty-two. Um, let's talk about you know, and, and and you're so thoughtful about your training, and you seem to be smart about your training. You're open-minded about what you're doing. You've trained in in physicals. Uh, you, you know, you've done physical training for so long, almost your entire life. So your experience in it is absolutely massive and your knowledge in it is huge. Let's talk about sort of aging and adaptations, both on the mat and off the mat for kind of being your, your healthiest and highest performing self. Because of course, for me, and, and that's something that I sort of started to really 
understand in my late twenties. When I was in my early and mid twenties, I was I was performing really well, but physically my health was very low. Uh, I, I was in I was very injured a lot. I was sore a lot. I was t- like basically a lot of things. I'd prioritize performance over health. And as I got into my late twenties, early thirties, and actually one of the things that I took away really from COVID and 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 the lockdowns, and it's something that George Hackensmith said, which is. Uh, strength cannot be divorced from health. They come together. And that's true to a degree. Um, obviously, some people who will push performance at the ex- uh, at, uh, to the detriment of health. And then, of course, you can be so healthy that you're never able to get to that next level. It's all about finding a balance. Uh, talk to me how you, the tips and tricks and, and strategies and philosophies you found both in jiu-jitsu and outside for finding that balance. Well, the first thing that I'd say is that sport isn't health. Understand that because that's the first step of anyone listening starting to get to grips with the fact that what we do on the mat well, is particularly jiu-jitsu. healthy, yeah, yeah. right? It can be healthy, but generally it isn't. There are elements of it that are supremely healthy, but especially when you start going to the extremes and yeah. you're training six times a week or even more, right? It's not healthy. Um, And so you have to find a way of striking a balance. And so what I've done, and and like you, I was, you know, I didn't start jujitsu till I was 29, 30. Mm. But for that first, particularly the first eight years until I got to about 38, it was just all about the smash. And, and, you know, and and as I've said before, many times, you know, Carlson's was full of a load of very very scary people they were either london doormen or they were eastern european people that had been through wars um or they were black belts in other martial arts we were all getting neck cranked up and you know look i still live with you know there was one particular dude who who neck cranked that the shit out of me and dickie mm. and both of us have got bad necks now because we didn't tap to neck cranks mm. because you could still breathe yeah right and the fact that your necks go you just ignore and many years later down the line. So the first thing that I'd say is this, really simple, tap. The mm. next thing that I'd say is this, when your fingers start giving you jip, start doing no gi, right? And if your fingers are hurting, you just stop doing gi for two weeks, give them a rest. Mm. In other words, you, whenever you go too deep down one road, if you're playing guard too much in the gi, you're going to end up with, with sore fingers. Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you really don't like doing no gi, then stop pulling guard. Start playing a passing game. That will give your fingers a rest. Yeah. Also, with you know, I'll just say one thing about the fingers. That obviously, I don't train much key now, but when I did, because I was into the grit training, I firstly doing some sort of grit training will make your fingers more resilient to the injuries mm-hmm. that you pick up. But just because you're playing sleeve grips or lapel grips doesn't mean your fingers have to be smashed up. Mm-hmm. And the biggest advice that I give people who say like, my fingers are wrecked. There's nothing I can do, and I go and play play this sleeve game stop taking uh, pocket grips these grips here you know when you, the, the the standard sleeve grip that you take where you're wrapping your fingers around and you're curling in you have to assume that you'll lose your grip sometime and if you lose your grip like that the way that you're going to lose it is they're going to be ripped open your fingers are going to be kind of dynamically concentrically pulled apart and that's what causes the damage so i will only ever take a pistol grip mm. because you know, pick, pick, picking up some material and then grabbing onto it like you would a barbell. And then if you lose that grip, your hand never changes shape. There isn't a secondary pull as you lose the, the pocket. The, ha- right. the hand stays exactly because the same shape. when you lose shape. that pocket grip, the fingers you've, got open a, up. you've got a secondary pull. Exactly. You've, you lose the grip, yep. but then where, you're at the tip, sorry, where the tips of your fingers are in the pocket, yep. that's the secondary pull. And exactly. that's what damages the finger knuckles. Exactly. exactly. You're absolutely correct. So, so this is something that I've always told people when they've asked me. I really think it's massive. I need to kind of put this out here more, more you know, make a video or something. But it's, and a lot of people, they, met, you know, they come and see me a year later and they go, it saved my hands because there are there is some adaptation. If you're training sleeve grips or pocket grips, uh, then that's what you're going to be used to. It's going to be easier for you to get in. It's going to feel stronger. But if you train those pistol grips more, it might take you a split second longer, especially to start with to get the position. But for me, it, it always felt natural because my grip strength when I was 
small and weak came from doing barbell stuff and doing farmer's walk. So that pistol grip position felt way stronger than my fingers are actually weaker than my closing strength is, my crushing strength is. So that position here where you're never, ever changing the shape of your hand, even when you lose the grip mm. and you don't get those fingers ripped open. So the, so the next thing that I'd say based on, on on this conversation is, and again, you know, I was so fortunate. We were all fortunate at Carlson's to, to, to have Wilson Jr. Because the other thing that Wilson Jr. insisted on, apart from doing no gi once a week, was that we all lifted weights once a week. Now, mm. I didn't need telling anyone. I was already lifting weights. But, he, you know, he used to line us up and say, guys, you, you must lift weights, you know. Yeah. And sometimes we'd go in and he'd actually have a load of discs, 20 kilo discs, and, and we'd spend half the class lifting weights, mm. you know. Crazy stuff. But, but what I would say is this, right? When you're in your 20s or late teens, 20s, early 30s, you don't need to worry about cardio. Mm. You've got it anyway. I tell you, if you're doing jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu is going to be enough to train your cardio, just rolling, mm. okay? You don't really, unless, you, unless you're going out to win IBJJF competitions and you're, to, and you, you're international level, right? Yep. Then it's a different conversation. But for the hobbyist, don't worry about cardio. You know, jiu-jitsu's got you. you, you you're going to increase your cardio just from rolling. Mm. Um, what jiu-jitsu is not going to do is make you properly strong. It'll get you. A, it'll get you a little. You, you know, you're going to grow a few little muscles, but you need you need to lift weights, yeah. right? And you don't necessarily need to lift weights to make yourself into a monster or become a bodybuilder or really become super strong. You're lifting weights so that you create almost an armadillo casing around your whole body. Because guess what? People are going to be trying to break your limbs. Mm. People are going to try and pop your elbows. You know. If you've got muscles around all of these limbs, it's almost like you've got a hard outer shell, which is going to help you and stop you getting so injured. Mm. So for people in their late teens, 20s and early 30s who don't weight train already, if you're doing jiu-jitsu at least once a week, you should be on a, a, on a weight training or it doesn't, when I say weights, I'm talking about resistance, okay? Yeah. I don't care. Your body doesn't care whether you're lifting human flesh or iron. Yeah. Right? It doesn't know. It doesn't really know whether you're doing a wide grip chin up or a wide grip pull down on a cable. Mm. Okay, resistance is resistance. You need to do resistance training for jujitsu. The other thing that I would really, really recommend is that you do yoga once a week. Maybe you can't do yoga once a week because you haven't got enough time. Well, have a decent stretch routine mm. where you're stretching your spine and your neck in both directions and you're stretching your groin properly fully every week um you're stretching your hamstrings because the thing about jiu-jitsu is especially gi not so much no gi but you're gripping and you're grabbing and all of your muscles are shortening yeah when you're in the gym you're holding and you're grabbing and you all of your muscles are shortening you owe it to your body to at least once a week to go and lengthen your muscles, which is mm. what yoga is, which is something that I've just, look, I've always stretched because I came from a Taekwondo background and Taekwondo stretching is very much yoga based. But, you know, I did a five or a 10 minute stretch three times a week. Now I'm doing an hour of yoga once mm. a week properly. I'm doing a vinyasa flow, which my partner is qualified to teach me and I've just fallen in love with it and it's really, really helpful. So anyway, moving on. When we get to about, 36 37 38 that's the time where the weight training isn't as important because your cardio starts dropping off mm. so that's the moment actually where for me i'm not as big and, and and muscly as i used to be because what i'm doing now is i'm training on my weak point which is cardio because i know that as i get older as you said earlier i've got a bit of old man strength yeah i'm still doing my weights but what I'm really focusing on is getting out and doing cardio mm. because as we get older, the cardio will drop off. And here's the other thing, especially as you get better and better at jujitsu, when you're in the academy rolling, you're not going to be taxing your cardio as much because you're better at jujitsu. Yeah. Right. So you get more to, efficient. You're yeah. more efficient. Right. It's not like when you're a white belt and a blue belt and it's rah, for six minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more, you know exactly what you're doing. You know, you can take a rest in positions. And so, you know, I would say that late 30s and certainly into 40s, you should be going out and doing some running or some cycling or getting on the Concept 2 rower and starting to, 
to, to, to train cardio mm. properly and scientifically. Can I just ask you one quick thing that I wanted to, to, to mention earlier when you uh, said it, which is running. How do you feel with running is on your knees? I think that long distance running is bad. All running is bad for your knees. Yeah. My knee surgeon, who was excellent, right, yeah. who did my meniscus in 2012, said to me, right, one thing, and he knew all about my jiu-jitsu career, blah, mm. blah, blah. Extreme, you know, he'd done a dozen judo players, yeah. does rugby players. He said, no more jogging. Yeah, I listened to him for a couple of years and I started <laughs> jogging again. But what I would say is this, is be scientific about your running. Jiu-jitsu is bad for your knees as well. Running's bad for your knees. Everything's bad for your knees. What I think in terms of cardio is this. If you can, don't run on concrete or on pavement. Go to the park and run. Mm -hmm. That will make a massive difference. The other thing is run in proper running shoes. Don't run in your fashionable trainers. Go out and buy some running shoes like some New Balance that you wouldn't be seen dead in going out to the bar, right? Um, buy proper running shoes. Make sure that you only do 500 miles maximum in those running shoes. I think you know, 500 kilometers I've got mine set to. Mm. I've got it on Strava. When they hit 500 kilometers, you get they get thrown away. Ready right because that again is a, and it seems like that's the cushioning yeah yeah because you know and don't what and don't wash 500 as well and don't put them in a washing machine yeah because if you put them in the washing machine when they go through a heat cycle you're changing the cushioning ability wow. okay um so be serious about your trainers being be scientific about it and the other thing i'd say is this for jujitsu I don't think there's any any need to do longer than five kilometers. Now, a five k run isn't. Far. I was hoping you were going to say fifty meters there. Yeah. That's about yeah. my limit. Uh, <laughs> look again. There's there's lots of stuff you should be doing. You, you know, I could talk about concept two. Yeah. Uh, uh, rowing, sprints, or you know, sprinting is really important. Going to, if you haven't got a concept two rower and doing interval training on it, do your sprints. You go to a football field, and the width of the football field. You sprint across, balls out. Yeah. Like, you, like you've got a gun to your head. Then you walk back and then you sprint across again. Yeah. Right? And you do five of those until you, ca until you can't go 100% anymore. Mm. Right? That's your sprint training. But then your 5K, you start doing as a jog. And when you get better and better at it, you get faster and faster. And the 5K is a distance that I don't feel is going to be too bad for your knees, especially if you're doing it on grass mm. or in the woods on dirt. Or, you know, doing one kilometer to get you to the woods and one kilometer to get you back from the woods and three kilometers in the wood. Find a 5K circuit yeah. because it's a distance that's enough to seriously get you fit and to spike your cardio but it's not so far that you get that thing that people get when they're training for marathons where their knees start falling apart. Mm. Okay, so work your cardio, um, look after your fingers and everything else, do some yoga. Uh, anything in terms of supplementation? Um, you know, as you get older, obviously one of the big things that, um, you, you know, especially for men, one of the massive things about aging is to, the testosterone starting to go down sort of as you get into your late 30s and 40s certainly 50s and 60s is that something you pay much attention to like with supplementation be it trt or hrt or sort of you know herbal testosterone sort of supporting things like that i'm not sure i've got an open mind about this dan and i would never judge anyone for the decisions that may, they make with their own body but i'm very very frightened of trt mm. And I'll tell you why. And I'm not in credit. There are some people in our jiu-jitsu community who are incredibly well-read on this. And, yeah, and ben, are, ben Poppleton's a really great example. I didn't want to mention any names. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's very open you're, with but it. You're, yeah. But you're absolutely yeah. right. He is incredibly well-read. Yeah. And he's researched. Yeah. He's not, he's not playing around. When he says something, he's got scientific papers to back it. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I want to get Ben back on the podcast at some point, And it's a subject that I'd love to chat to him about because he's very open about it. Yeah. So I don't normally talk about subjects that I don't feel that I'm qualified to talk in, but sure. I'm going to now. Sure. But I want to qualify what I'm about to say by saying I'm unqualified. Sure. I don't, I, I'm not as well read as I should be. Sure. The reason why I'm nervous about TRT is because I came up through bodybuilding gyms and I saw a lot of people um, basically hurt themselves with performance enhancing drugs and with testosterone, which of course is a performance enhancing drug. Sure. 
Probably because they overdid it. But anyway, my nervousness about TRT mm. and what has stopped me ever doing it is the fact that when you start supplementing with testosterone, your body goes, oh, I'm getting an injection. I can stop making my, I can stop producing my own. Yeah. I don't want that to happen. The thought of me putting something into my body and then at a later date coming off it and my body not responding and having none, zero production or very low production of its own, it feels to me like I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm. Okay. And well, so, and so I, here's the thing. Yeah. This is what I've always done about testosterone. And I'm going to have, I'm going to get trolled about this. You're going to have people saying, there's no such thing. It's an old wives tale. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But I take a, sub, a supplement called Tribulus. I remember you talking it. Wasn't that your username or something back in the day? So that was Dickie's username. Was it Dickie's? Yeah. Dickie, yeah. Dickie Martin's username on SFUK was yeah. Tribulus. See, I remember. Yeah. yeah. So me and Dickie started taking Tribulus at, around about the same time when when it was kind of being hailed as this new, you know, the, 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 this new kind of bodybuilding super supplement. Yeah. Now, Tribulus, whether you believe the hype or not, it's a root extract which comes from Siberia. And, you know, the, the, the people that are really into it will say, oh, yeah, it's, it's how, what Russian bears used to get horny. Yeah. But, and they dig it up. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But, you know, whatever, that's where it's from. And basically, what, there are some people that believe this and some people that don't, that when you take a Tribulus supplement, uh, your, body start, uh, your body's natural testosterone production increases mm. so in other words it's very different to trt you're basically taking a supplement to encourage your body's own testosterone production yeah and i've always taken i've taken that sporadically since i was 30 very unscientifically if i start to feel a little bit weak and feeble and i'm getting a little bit tired when i wake up in the mornings i think i need to buy some tribulus mm. and i go out and buy some now what P that placebo is a strong effect placebos maybe who knows it's, yeah. it's what but what i would say to you is this dan and people can make of this what they wish it's a strong placebo brother <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I you saying it years ago. i'm waking up in the morning and i'm feeling great <laughs> but that's what you want isn't it i always say like uh um i uh I, I went to a talk once about placebos and even like the, the effect of placebos, how much they work and even honest placebos. Yeah. So a, an honest placebo is I give you a pill. I tell you that it's sugar mm. and you take it and you feel better. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I'm like, oh, at some point I'm going to make up like a, a bottle, fill it with sugar tablets yeah. and it would just say super powerful steroids, make you bigger and stronger on the back, not real steroids, just sugar, give it to you and it will have a positive effect. But it's just really interesting that, like yeah. the way that the mind works is able to do stuff like that. But so, so the other thing that happened was when about five years ago, six years ago, we were, we tried all different tribulus products and Dickie got this tribulus, uh, which was made by a company called MHP, which makes protein powders and stuff. It's quite uh -huh. a well-known yeah. bodybuilding supplement company. And this tribulus was called T-Bomb. Three times stronger, yeah. just like you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we took that and it was like, oh my God, what the hell is this stuff? This is, you know, this is like, it's like rocket fuel. I'm hoping you say you looked on the packet and it's the exact same as everything else or? It just, it's, you know, I, do you know what? I haven't even looked on the packet. Yeah. I, I, as I say, I'm yeah. not scientific about it. We just found this, this product that seemed to be stronger. So we started taking that and then the rumor has it it got banned in the uk you can't buy it off the shelf in the uk oh wow however it's still available in the states so i basically every couple of months or every three or four months i i buy a couple of tubs from ebay.com and i import it from from america i have to pay you know an extra 35 quid for the damn stuff yeah um in customs charges and it arrives in an envelope and it's <laughs> and it's it's mhp t-bomb yeah. and that's and that's what i use Listen, it could be uh, a placebo, but I don't think it is. It makes me feel absolutely I, I, I great. I think it's probably legit. Like, uh, I think um, a lot of people, uh, as soon as you mention herbal, yeah. people go, um, oh, well, that's bollocks then. Yeah. But people forget that almost every single pharmaceutical drug that we use is derived from 
herbs and plants and stuff like that so yeah. herbs certainly have a lot of power to them and uh, i mean there's loads out there that support and testosterone or stuff I, like that and uh, i have no doubt that it works the way i see it in my very again using the word unscientific because i must stress this the way i see it in my unscientific analysis of this is that potentially it's giving me 10 percent what trt may give mm. me but at the same time Without any, any of the side negativity effects, yeah. side effects, when I eventually come, when I come off, when I finish some tribulus, you know, nothing happens. I feel great. Everything feels the same. Probably 10, 12 weeks later, I just to th think to myself, oh, I'm not feeling really feeling like going training tonight. Oh, I know what it is. I order some more tribulus. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, the thing with TRT is you, you never come off. No. That, that, that's what it is. Is yeah. that, that's why you don't start it when you're in your, you know 20s or 30s but because you know when you're in your 40s or 50s and you feel like this is affecting the quality of your life um you 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 step you take a low dose of testosterone that would basically bring you up to kind of mid-20s level and then you stay on it until you die because it you know it, because, it worked for randy couture yeah, there you go it worked for a lot of people uh <laughs> anyway underhooks gable grip <laughs> but but here's the thing let me just and i really want to stress this dan I'm really open-minded and non-judgmental sure. about this. People have th – these are our bodies. W they belong to us. Mm. And we all, we all have every right to make a personal decision mm. about what we are going to put into our bodies or what we're not going to put into our bodies. And whether someone chooses to take TRT is the same as whether they choose to drink alcohol or not. It's no different. It's whether they choose to, to – what, what food they put into their mm. bodies, you know? Yeah, I guess it's, it's, it, it, it's, it becomes different when um, people start – taking performance enhancing drugs uh to get bigger and stronger to do mma or to do grappling where it's actually a potential to hurt each other that's a whole whole different conversation. of course that's a, that is a that's whole, a whole different, different conversation, conversation which we won't even and, get into. And, yeah exactly yeah. but yeah 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 for sure i mean last thing uh we i was so confident i'm like we're, we're not gonna be over three hours but i genuinely where are we right we're, now? We're, we're at two hours 48 so like we could just do this every uh like we could go on do all you know day. what we shouldn't do though we shouldn't leave it six years again Ab oh no we yeah, won't we'll leave we it won't. a couple of years absolutely yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll be back for sure um i guess the last couple of things i want to ask you is you mentioned one already uh or you mentioned a couple of times about um I can think we, we listen said, dan can we hit pause so i can go and have a pee yeah yeah, yeah of course yeah, yeah. So kind of what, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you was, you know, you mentioned earlier about how your opinion changed about Nogi gradings or stuff like this. I guess that's the big question because I find that, that one of the most interesting things, um, and, and you can only really ask someone who is open-minded, which is what is something that you believed when I spoke to you six years ago that you no longer believe now or an opinion that you had then that has changed now? tough question Dan it is a tough question and, and and for me it's like that those are the those are the most interesting th questions because mm. there are loads of things that I believed at one point and I've and 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 at but at that one point I never thought would change mm. and then be, be it three or five or ten years later I have a completely different opinion on and it might be one that you might have to, it uh, might take look, longer to think about but is my, there anything that comes to mind just that my whole understanding and thought process about brazilian jiu-jitsu has matured and become more open-minded mm. and that has been part of the it's first of all watching the evolution of our sport and what it's become it's a very different sport than it was 26 years ago yeah. even another thing is that as i've got older i've become more ex my acceptance level has risen has risen because i've had to accept that i'm not the athletic force that I once was and that I've realized that there are many, many different ways to do jujitsu and that it doesn't all have to be hardcore smash and that, you know, and that pot potentially how I'm feeling now about my body is how some people feel when they're 21 about their bodies. Mm. And what I always say to my jiu-jitsu students, um, I'm very fond of saying this, is that jiu-jitsu is whatever you want it to be. There are many, many different facets to jiu-jitsu. And what we're trying to do at, at Carlson Gracie London is we're trying to support everyone's vision of what their own jiu-jitsu should be. Firstly, there are going to be some people that want to be a com com competition jiu-jitsu player. That's, mm. that's what gets them hot. 
that's what's exciting for them. There are going to be other people that just come into the Jiu-Jitsu Academy and they want to do something that is going to get them fit, make friends, and potentially, if the worst ever happens, help them a little bit in self-defense if they wake up in the middle of the night and there's someone in their bed sit or whatever, right? Then there's going to be other people that want to come in and want to be an MMA fighter. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that, we sh- you know, as an instructor and, a, you know, a co-owner of a gym, I want to support every single person and what, what they want jiu-jitsu to be because it's so infinite. And anything that isn't supporting that is just really stifling jiu-jitsu's development. And, you know, and, and as it gets more mainstream, we've got a responsibility to keep it real mm. and to make sure it doesn't get softened. But we've also got a responsibility to make sure that it grows. And it's finding that balance and mm. embracing that balance. And in the same way as jiu-jitsu adapts, what is jiu-jitsu if it isn't adaptive? Yeah. You know, as I said, there's a kid somewhere in Milton Keynes finding a new submission in a garage right now yeah. that no one knows. And the sport adapts and is infinite. And I think our understanding of it must be. Um, I'm, as you know, I'm really, really into the self-defense side of jiu-jitsu. And as I get older, the more I realize that no one or very, very few people walk into a jiu-jitsu academy because they want to be the IBJJF European champion. They walk in, most people walk into a jiu-jitsu academy with something in their mind regarding self-defense. Mm. It might not be their absolute priority. It might be that they've moved to a new city and that they've heard it's good fun that you can meet friends or whatever, or, you know, it's a good thing for losing weight. But every single person who walks into an academy is going to have some idea that it's going to help them with self-defense. And what I see, what my, one of my roles at, at Carlson Gracie is, for that first year, until they decide what they're going to specialize in, whether it's IBJJF, whether it's going to be nogi, whether they're actually going to go into MMA, mm. or whether they just enjoy jiu-jitsu as a social thing, what I'm trying to do before they start getting fed into Freddie's class, learning heel hooks, Dickie's class, learning, you know, very, very modern IBJJF winning jiu-jitsu is I'm trying to give them that old school uh, self-defense jiu-jitsu that if shit ever happens at a bus stop, they're going to know what to do. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's interesting when you talk about the self-defense, self-defense thing. Do you think that that desire for self-defense is, is more just confidence? You know, there's there's something about being able to I feel like a blue belt, a purple belt, a brown belt, a black belt just walks through life with a different attitude because they know if something was to happen, they would at least have an idea of what to do. Oh, Dan, it's so deep what you've just said and it's so relevant. And and thank you for saying that because I've got a saying, I probably read it on a meme somewhere once upon a time, but a saying that continually is in my subconscious is you're never alone if you've got jujitsu and, 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 and what you've just said is exactly that. As black belts, and even as a 52-year-old, I never feel like I'm threatened. I never, f- you know, I, obviously I'm not going to make stupid mistakes like going into the wrong kebab shop yeah. in the wrong part of town at the wrong time, you know. But but that is part of jiu-jitsu. Part of jiu-jitsu is recognising when to cross the road. Mm. In the same way as when that first hand goes in your collar, you deal with that hand. You don't let it start trying to escape when the second hand comes into your collar. Yeah. Right? Because it's too late. Crossing the road is very much, you know, and that, that's the thing. This is what jiu-jitsu is all about. Jiu-jitsu isn't just about fighting. Yeah. It's, it's a roadmap for life. And, you know, again, going over everything that everyone knows, you know, you get comfortable being uncomfortable, you, you know, so that you're not panicking. And understanding, and, and you know, what I try and do with my self-defense in, in jiu-jitsu, it's, it's not nearly as kind of technical as, as the Gracie Academy's version of it. It's more a kind of Jeff Thompson type, this is your fence, mm. right? Decide how many times you're going to allow someone to hit your fence yeah. before you actually do a preemptive strike. Think about the preemptive strike. Think about the court case that's going to come in. Mm. Think about the CCTV. We're in a major city. You're always under CCTV. Before you engage, and this is the number one priority, Dan, 
before we engage in any kind of fight, there is always the opportunity to remove ourselves from the situation. It's very, very rare, whether you're at a bus stop, whether, where, that there isn't an opportunity before the clinch to get the hell out of there and run. Mm. And my first lesson, my first speech about self-defense to the guys is, remember, when you're presented with this problem, that you could be entering into something that's going to change your life, either physically, or Legally. you're going to lose your job, yeah. which will mean you're going to lose your house, which potentially means your wife's going to leave you because you got into a fight on the street, you stupid idiot. You know, there's a knock-on effect. Yeah. Do you really need to engage? Perhaps if you're at your front door or it's the middle of the night and you've woken up and there's a burglar in your room, whatever it is. So now let's talk about if you have to engage, how to engage. You know, mm. Don't stand there bobbing and weaving thinking you're a boxer because if you haven't been learned to strike, guess what? You're going to get knocked out. Mm. Okay, How to get into a clinch, how to join you know, Muay Thai and wrestling, how to, to join a plum clinch into a guillotine, which I know you're going to love. Yeah. Now, this is, this is what you get when, when you walk into my class for the first time. Yeah. You know, massive, massive prioritizing the guillotine from the plum clinch, um, you know. And if we're doing jiu-jitsu, how to pull guard into the guillotine. Mm. If you're not doing jiu-jitsu, let's put them to sleep standing and then run. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, uh, you know, I think it is confidence and I think that we that as jiu-jitsu I think from purple belt onwards people do have an innate confidence. I hope that it doesn't create uh an o being overconfident. Yeah. Because the other thing that I always talk about is listen everyone's got a knife. Yeah. And if they haven't got a knife they've got a gun. One of the other things that when actually which I've forgotten about which I wanted to talk to you about today is you know with what's going on with knife crime on the streets of London and, and, and every single city in the UK and even out in the sticks now as well, I've got a concern about it because we always say, oh, listen, get the kids into boxing, get the kids into jiu-jitsu. And I think that that's legit, right? Mm. But there's a little subconscious voice in the back of my mind saying... Giving confidence to people who are going to end up getting... Well, I worry... And, it, you know, it's... It's not this. Is, I'm, I'm normally full of positivity. Yeah. I'm going to say something negative now. I wonder often why all of these kids are carrying knives, and it really hurts me to think this. But I wonder whether it's because so many people train that they're not confident that they can win a street fight anymore because they might come up against a guy that does Muay Thai or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And I wonder whether actually that fear makes them think, well, I need something to, to, to equalize the, the balance. And so I'm going to put a knife in my pocket. I don't I think don't, that's I the case. Know. I hope so, Dan. I really I hope so. I'll tell you There's what. It's a very dark thought. Of I, I, it is. And I don't think that's the case. I, I don't think that the, the, the sort of kids that are in gangs that are the ones in the, you know, it's all gangs, right? Mm. It, it's yeah. all gang related. Is the postcode. Yeah. It's postcodes yeah. and every, all of that stuff. And these kids aren't training. And I think the simple part of it is these kids are, they're, they're cowards and they want an easy way. Mm. And the knife is the equalizer. Yeah. The equalizer is the advantage. Yeah. And as soon as one has a knife, then you carry a knife because he has a knife. And then, mm. well, they're carrying knives. I think it, it's one of those things where um, the, the, the idea of a fair fight is not even in their comprehension. And that's the problem. I think that if we had more people boxing, Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu. I mean, even if they were kids that were up to no good or in gangs, but they could have a proper straightener, like, like you know, like like back in the day. But I don't think these kids are consciously thinking, "Oh, I'm worried that they might be grappling, they might be boxing, so I'm going to have a knife." I think they they just have a knife because it's the easy way out. I'm glad you said that, and I'm glad that I'm wrong about that. Well, um, I, I I'm not sure, but but if I had to make a guess, I definitely say that was the case. Do you know it's such a divisive yeah. thought process that I didn't even re you could see I, I was uncomfortable saying it. Yeah. What I would say for, on a positive note is, we look Carlson Gracie London is you know as everywhere in London you know everywhere in London is is next to a dodgy area. Yeah. You know we're not in the best area of London. You know we get a lot of youth coming into our club. And I've seen hundreds of mm. youths change their life around. They come in monosyllabic, not really wanting to engage with other members of society beyond their own peer set. Yeah. Um, and suddenly, you know, 
four or five months later, they can talk to a 50 year old man, 30 year old woman, you know, they're, they're, they're upstanding, helpful members of the jiu jitsu community. Yeah. They've fallen in love with something and they've changed their life around. That's the positive from jiu jitsu. Um, you know, I think that it really, re you know, it's a great leveler. You know, there are, you know, no one's rich on the mat, no one's poor on the mat. No one, you know, it doesn't matter what house you live in on the mat. Yeah. Everyone's the same. All they've got is jujitsu. Is jujitsu. Mm. And all they've got is their level. And the people that aren't as good as the others just want to get better. Yeah. And also, every jujitsu club I've ever been at has been a, when I say welcoming place, I'm not talking about, say, you know, let's all go out for pizza later, but I'm saying that. People want to help people get better at jiu-jitsu. Mm. That you know, you see, the class finishes and there's still nine people sitting on the mat talking about, oh well, but if I put this lapel here and you know, and everyone's trying to get better together. You know, it's not kind of a secretive thing. It's like everyone's working together mm. and sharing knowledge, and that's one of the great look. You, here's the thing. I'm going to answer that question now. What I would have changed my mind about? Yeah. Because I, do you know what? I I definitely kind of avoided that question and didn't answer it directly. Six years ago, I would have said YouTube, YouTube jiu-jitsu is bad. Yeah. It's not. It's great. It's a good thing. Yeah. Everyone's getting better. Everyone's sharing knowledge. Man, how wrong I was about that. You know. I mean, I think I think that uh, I don't necessarily think you were wrong. I think that ten years ago, jiu-jitsu youtube jiu-jitsu was bad i think that there's just better depending on who you watch yeah, yeah there's just there's just better grapplers putting out better content these days yeah. but i think uh our access to um high quality i think that's the the, the yeah. important thing high quality jiu-jitsu techniques these days um is making uh the the, the cutting edge of jiu-jitsu accessible for all yeah. yeah 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 and i think that that's a really positive thing because again jiu-jitsu of moves forward we're all marching forward together mm. You know, and I think, you know, nothing will be nothing will take the place of a great instructor student relationship with a, a, a mentorship in the same way as anything in life. You yeah. know, mentors are a good thing. Um, but I think it's wonderful that students can go and get another perspective from watching something on YouTube. Mm. They can look at different, you know, because, look, I don't know every single way to do an arm bar, yeah. you know, and I think and, I, and when someone comes in and says, oh, I look, I, you know. I saw Danaher do this. What do you think of that? Um, Show me. Or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And sometimes I go, man, I haven't seen that. That's great. Yeah. You know, and, and so, yeah, we're all learning together. And that's the wonderful thing about jiu-jitsu. It's not rigid. There's only so many different ways you can throw a punch. Yeah. Right? Ju as I keep saying, jiu-jitsu is infinite. It and is, that's yeah. why It's not for dummies, you know, that's, mm. and that's why it's addictive. Mm. That's why we all love it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And then finally, last question is, you know, we've spoken a lot about how jiu-jitsu has advanced, especially over the, the period of the last six years since we last spoke. But also, what do you wish to see from jiu-jitsu that continue to push it in the right direction over the next five, year, five ten years? I'd like, to, I'd like to see drug testing. Okay. Right? And I'm not just talking about any... I, I mean, are we, are we talking about drug testing ADCC? Yeah. <sighs> It's like it's like drug testing pride. And by the way, hold on a second. I'm not. I don't want to single out ADCC because they're yeah, doing ADC a great, they're doing a great great yeah. job, right? But they're, but, but, they're, but they're doing a great job. ADC well, I'm talking about ADCC has got to be the most riddled um, uh, tournament in the world when it comes to when it comes to, to, to performance enhancing drugs. As I say, I'm not going to judge anyone <laughs> because there's no t is there, there's no testing, right? No, right. So I'm not going to judge anyone because if there's no testing, it's within the rules. Yeah, it it feels very. But, but, yeah. but what I do feel is I think that the UFC has benefited massively from testing, right? Yeah. I I like to read. Mm. I've read all about drugs in cycling. I've read all about the, the Balco scandal with Barry Bonds, the baseball player. You know, I know an awful lot about this subject because it's, it's an interesting subject it to, is, yeah. to research and to read about. And what I think is that I think cycling's a better sport since they started testing more heavily. I'm not saying no one cheats in cycling, mm. but I'm saying that it's much, much harder to pass a test. Mm. I, and I could be wrong about this because I'm not on the cutting edge of MMA, but man, it looks hard to me to be dirty in, in, in the UFC now. It looks it, it looks hard to pass a test. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, but 
Jiu-Jitsu cannot do what the UFC have done. Not even close to it. UFC basically has the greatest drug testing program in the world. That's what I thought. That they, they genuinely Who's the do. the dude that runs it? Who, who um, was the dude that, who busted Lance Armstrong? By yeah, the way? I can't remember his name. He, he was the head. head of USADA and, yeah. and now he works for yeah. the UFC. Yeah, I mean, it's under USADA, but yeah. the, 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 the thing is with the UFC and why... He's like the rock star drug testing dude. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's not playing. No, no, no. He's no, no, saying, no. listen, if we take your hair out and in 10 years time we find a new test and find out you were dirty we're yeah, going to strip we're you, you. Yeah, and yeah, your yeah. legacy's gone yeah 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 he's not playing is, is it N- Navinsky or yeah something, Dave, Dave N- something like that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you're absolutely right but they uh, he busted Lance Armstrong yeah 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 he went, yeah. He went after him when, when the cycling federations weren't doing anything I mean to be fair Lance never got caught Mm. He came. He he came clean himself, uh, which was the, sort of the interesting. I, I mean, I'm sure someone had some dirt on him that said, "If you don't come clean, then we're going to expose." But uh, Lance was an interesting one for sure. But you saw the the UFC program. It, it works because they're under contract. By the way, let me just say this. Yeah. Regardless of drugs, I'm a massive Lance fan. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And I know he's an ass. Yeah. But on all the you know the best. The, the, yeah. 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 To have that. I've, I'm going to win and I'm going to be yeah, the yeah, best. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's part of a personality that can be unlikable. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It right? is. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the greats are, are, are completely mad and, yeah. um, yeah, uh, unique uh, individuals. Right. But anyway, it, go on. Sorry. I'm yeah. Not- no, no, that's okay. So the, you, you saw the thing works because, uh, they're all under contract. So I'm not sure if you, if, if, if you, if you know the specifics, but basically there's an app, um, you need to, uh, so every UFC fighter in the testing pool, which is every single one has this app on their phone, the USADA app, and they have to let this app or USADA know where they are at all times. Yep. As in at any time you want to go on, you, you go away, let's say I'm in the UK, I'm in London and I want to go over and I want to spend five hours in Manchester. I got to tell them that because they could come to Manchester. And test me there. So they, they're they going to know where you are 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And they can come and ask for a sample whenever they want. And this has actually got to the point where it was getting kind of ridiculous. They were, they were, te- they tested, uh, I think Volkanovsky or someone, someone recently, one of the, uh, you know, in a championship fight, they tested him at like seven o'clock in the morning, the day of his weigh-ins or five o'clock in the morning at the day of the way, something ridiculous. But they will come to you at three in the morning, four in the morning, five in the morning. Here's a cup pissing it we're gonna watch you you're not doing any funny business so it, it's a level where because what happens is obviously people they're a tester uh the mundials now for medalists ibjjf are doing testing they've been doing testing for the last five or six years i'd like to see more yeah but how are you going to test an athlete outside a competition and that's the problem mm. if you know when the test is coming it basically makes it irrelevant and that is the issue that you have because we're at a level of uh chemical and scientific competency when it comes to drug testing where if you know that my test date is going to be this date well then i can be juicing for eight weeks and i can be clean pissing clean depending on what chemicals i use by the uh by the date that i'm going to be tested so the only way that you really clear up a sport and then it just comes down to well the the lower level athletes who can't afford the really advanced stuff and the doctors they help them game the system well then they're going to get penalized but the guys at the top are not uh and you can make that argument in 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 even something like the ufc where there's going to be drugs that the usada don't even know about they don't even know what they're looking for yet and in five or ten years time people are going to become well that's what happened with the balco scandal are you aware of how that of of what happened the 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 guy yeah 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 Yeah, in baseball yeah well and throughout uh athletics yeah balco was a lab right yeah and it and it was run by someone called uh I'm not going to name names, actually, because I don't want to get sued. But anyway, um, it's old news. Anyone can Google it. But what happened was this guy said, right, so they're testing for these steroids. Well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to look back over uh, material of people who were at medical school who basically designed steroids 25 years ago when they were at medical school. They pitched them to chemical companies and because of whatever because they were either too expensive to make or the side effects 
tipped the, the, the balance and, and, and it didn't look like it was a great drug to make. They didn't get made. So he would get in contact with these dudes and say, yeah. look, I pulled your paper from 25 years ago when you, were, when you were a medical student. You designed this steroid and no one ever bought it. Can I buy the? Can, can I buy it from you? Wow. And could you come and make it for me? And so the way that all of those guys in U.S. athletics were yeah. getting away with it, and this is old news now, was they were taking steroids that weren't on the market, so there was no test for them. Yeah, it was genius. Yeah, this, uh, essentially, it was genius. Designer drugs. And, and yeah. by the way, you know, Ben, ben uh, who was uh, who was the guy that won the hundred meters in 1988? Ben, he was a Canadian sprinter. Yeah. Anyway, know. yeah, he got nobbled taking, uh, taking a very, as you say, a diazepam or something. Uh, not diazepam, but a dinobol or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that you know, like a real old-fashioned steroid. Yeah. He should never have been taking it. It came up in the test immediately, and every, everyone who was in that race saw him stripped of his medals and said, oh, he was out of order doing it. It then turns out over the next six or seven years, every single person who was in that race... I remember that. Every, got, single, every, every single one. And in what that, they'd yeah. been doing was taking drugs which had you know no yeah. one knew existed, so yeah. there's no test for them. Yeah. Anyway, we're digressing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I just want that, to see... That was a, a long yeah. conversation on steroids yeah. based on clean up the sport. Yeah. I, I, I want to see... Yeah, I, I want to see all jiu-jitsu start getting more drug tested and i understand that it's really difficult to do but i think it's something that everyone has to work towards because what's scaring the shit out of me mm. is 17 18 year old kids mm. who love jujitsu and have been doing it since they were nine years old right suddenly thinking to themselves i can't get to the highest level they look at a gordon ryan or a Andre or something yeah uh, uh, and that scares the shit out of me because those kids you know it's to me it's no different to taking any other recreational drug it's, For them, it's, it's a, a massive risk mm. it's a massive risk that can end up hurting you later on in your life mm. and i'd like to know that our sport isn't encouraging that that's what worries me. It's the 17, sure. 18 year olds that who are meddling at blue belt or purple belt and thinking, well, if I want, you know, I've got, I've got to get on the juice if I want to do this at brown belt. Mm. You know, I'm really, really worried about those guys. Yeah. And the other thing that I'd like to see, and, and from an MMA perspective, and I wrote about this on Facebook recently, is I really think that weight cutting's got to stop. Yeah. I, th I think that they need to start doing weigh ins. Just as seriously as you just described their blood, their, their drug testing. Yeah. Tell you what, when they're drug testing, then why don't they take some damn scales? Yeah. And if you're a certain amount more than what you're going to fight at, if you're, say, five kilos more than what your fighting weight is, then guess what? You're not yeah. allowed to fight at that mm. weight. They've got to have out, they can't keep on with one weigh in, which is the day before. Mm hmm. They should through the whole. I'm not saying for the whole of someone's life, but through the camp. Yeah, there should be an agree. And I'm not sure exactly what the parameters are. And people that are more experienced in MMA than me, I'm just a fan. But I think that that's bad. It, it's bad for on so many levels, especially with concussion. Yeah. Okay. Draining yourself with from water. We are 90% water. Depleting your water the day before you go into war. Yeah. Is is dumb, right? And, and we owe it to those athletes to do something about it. Yeah. And, and it feels to me like they should be tested throughout their camp. And if there's something like more than five kilos above what they're going to fight at, they shouldn't be allowed to fight. Mm. And then I think that the, there would be a, a more level playing field. Mm. I'd really like to see that. Um, luckily in jiu-jitsu, I think people don't really weight cut in jiu-jitsu because it's not worth it. Because if you're getting weighed as you walk on the mat, yeah. a weight cut is you're going to be – I've tried it. And yep. it's shit horrible. I prefer to fight in the weight above. Yeah. Or to do what I've done, which is be sensible with my diet and naturally come down through diet rather than through, you know, salt baths and, and saunas. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, it's not as much of an issue in jiu-jitsu for sure. In MMA, yeah, huge issue. I agree with you as well. Mm. Um, Simon, anything that you want to say to the jiu-jitsu community, listen to this podcast, final thing for you, and, and, and any final parting words or anything you want to say at all? Uh, I just want to say that, I th look, you know, with the UK BJJ Underground, we've been, you know, 
th- th- there has been negativity where people have said, oh, look, you know, there's witch hunts for fake black belts and all of that stuff. And, that, you know, of course, with anything on the net, there's going to be positives and that negatives. Was the, that was the most fun that we ever had, though. But we haven't had any of those in years. I feel like our community has benefited and we are now at a situation with where the sport we're in a good place yeah we don't really have any charlatans in jiu-jitsu this it kind of became known that you couldn't bullshit in uk brazilian jiu-jitsu you get called out on it yeah i think that we've got a massively buoyant sport that every single person listening to that pod to this podcast has had a part in building we've built it from the ground up all together um, through having an incredibly helpful uh, and positive community in the whole. I think that UK BJJ is in an excellent, excellent uh, point in its development. I don't think, I think that the students have got as, so much choice now about who they want to train with, where they want to train. You know, jiu-jitsu is almost becoming a high street sport now, mm. which is which is great. Um I think there's choice. Choice is good. Choice keeps on with the evolution. The one thing that I'd say is competition organizers in the UK. Can you yeah. please start collaborating with each other? Yeah. Can you please start communicating? This is one thing we didn't chat about, but there's can you it's getting please? A little bit out yeah, of I mean, you know, there's 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 you know, there's a competition one week on on a Saturday in Potter's Bar and another one in Barnet on yeah. the same day. You know. I understand if there's one in Manchester and another one in Southampton, I completely get it. Um, what's not positive is uh, is people stamping on each other's competitions. Mm. Because what it does is it actually stifles the growth because it means that neither competition has the full, uh, it, you know, someone that goes and wins gold at competition A isn't going to have been, been through as many hard fights as they would have been. Yeah. It basically dilutes the, yeah. com- the the competition arena, and what I'd like to see is competition runners um, starting to collaborate more, starting to work to work with each other on the timetable, and n- and not just for the students, referees as well. Mm. Okay, it will mean that we can stop having terrible referees at competitions make sure that they're that they are at the very least uk bjja qualified if not ibjjf qualified you know um you know we we owe it to the students to have high quality refs to have competitions where when you win a gold it really is a gold um and you know and i think that yeah i think that that's what i'd like to see that's what i'd like to see in uk bjj the the uh, right now it's great that people are making money from competitions. I'm a free market guy. Mm-hmm. I think that that's wonderful. But what I think is that right now it's it's a part of the sport that isn't helping with growth. Mm. Um, and and when I say growth, what I want is for our young athletes to get better and go and win the worlds. Yeah, and they're only going to do that if they get tested at competition rather than only going and having three fights because there's another competition around the corner that day. Mm. So half the people didn't turn up. Yeah, no, I think you're spot on about that. I think uh, we need to make sure that we're not oversaturating the market. Um, It definitely feels like that at the moment. All of the tournaments that I'm seeing uh, these days are very, very undersubscribed. And I think it's, it's just because Mm. there's so many people, you know, so many tournaments going around. So anyway, Simon, thank you so much. We've done just under three and a half hours. Um, And my camera cut out about 20 minutes ago. I should have deleted some stuff off of it. I should have known better. Uh, We were always going to be over three hours. Uh, Simon, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you back on. Um, it's a pleasure thanks Dan I really appreciate it and thanks for coming training man um, you know next time I'll come and do I'll come to your we're going to come do some stones and, you, and you sandbags can, you yeah? can get your own back on me <laughs> absolutely uh, Simon it's, uh, it's such a pleasure you know you know one of one of the most popular episodes I've ever had and uh, it's um, I look forward to chatting again not in six years time yeah we'll, well thank you then. Dan and thank you to everyone if you've got this far in it thank you very much for giving us over three hours of your time you know, I, look, I love talking about jujitsu and anything else. Um, so thank you for having me on. And Can't me the wait time. to do it again. Nice All one, right. Simon. Cheers. Cheers, man. Cheers, buddy. That is it, guys. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you want to follow or find out more about Simon Hayes, then I know he's on Facebook. Otherwise, his Instagram is at Simon Purple Hayes. 
Um, if you want to go train with Simon, then you want to be checking out Carlson Gracie London. And the website is bjjlondon.com. As always, if you want to get in contact with me, follow me or the podcast, then the best place is Instagram. My handle is at raspberry underscore ape. You can also follow the podcast specifically, which is at raspberry ape podcast um also check out my website which is raspberryape.com and if you want to email me then it is uh podcast at raspberryape.com um obviously you can check out this podcast on spotify soundcloud itunes um or check out the video on youtube if you haven't checked it out already if you're not watching the video already uh i know it's been relatively quiet on the podcast front this year a lot of people keep asking me is the podcast still going the podcast is always going um it's just because i always record in person it can be difficult especially it's a very mobile setup at the moment i'm moving around to different places but i have some really really great episodes lined up um, over the next couple of months and also the beginning of next year i'm hoping to do some big seminar tours and take my mics with me and do podcasts all over the country so hopefully lots of great episodes coming in the near future so stay tuned share uh comment like all of that stuff that you meant to say when you when, when you're finished doing stuff but yeah uh, thank you for listening and i will catch you guys next time take it easy